This is Adam Graham from Pretty Much the Present bringing you a week of old time radio podcasts. These episodes were originally released back in 2011. And we're releasing them here pretty much as is with only some extraneous bits such as the opening from all of the episodes after the first episode removed. Because these are old, it should be noted that any offers or promotions mentioned in the episode may not be valid unless they're currently mentioned on the Great Detectives website. Here now is a week of old time radio detective podcast. Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you've got a comment, go ahead and send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. And uh, follow us over on Facebook, facebook facebook.greatdetectives.net. Well, I've I've actually dropped mentions of Podcast Alley, uh, from the show just because uh, people weren't getting their vote confirmations if they weren't signed up and they also weren't uh, were having trouble sign, signing up. Well Podcast Alley is now fixed and we do actually have some votes I guess from all the months where I was encouraging folks to cast their votes there. Uh, so you can vote uh, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net Before we do get started with today's show I do want to encourage you to check out Tales of the Dim Night. It's a great superhero uh, spoof with a good, solid family story to go with it. If you're a fan of vintage superhero uh, shows and radio programs, I think you will enjoy Tales of the Dim Night. It is available for your Kindle, for your iPad, or in good old-fashioned paperback. More information, including the first chapter, are available at dimnight.com. That's D-I-M-K-N-I-G-H-T dot com. Well, we're going to get into today's episode of The Abbots. This one is called The Burnt Copper Powder. After all, if your husband were a private detective, and he kept talking about the body beautiful, how could you tell if he meant one of his beautiful clients or a corpse? The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Pat and Jean Abbott, those popular characters of detective fiction created by Francis Crane. Tonight we are honored with the appearance of Miss Claire Luce, world-famous dramatic actress who is making one of her rare radio dramatic appearances on The Adventures of the Abbots. NBC invites you to join Pat and Jean each week at this time for another exciting recorded adventure in romance and crime. And here is Jean Abbott to set the stage for tonight's puzzle in murder. A story entitled, The Burnt Copper Powder. Pat was at his office in San Francisco. I was out of town visiting my family. It was about six in the evening. The lights of the Golden Gate Bridge were just beginning to wink at my husband. Naturally, he was desperately lonesome without me, so he called me long distance. Jean, darling, can you hear me? Oh, 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 perfectly. Stop shouting. They perfected Mr. Bell's invention, you know. (laughs) Did you get my telegram? Oh, it was very clever, Pat. How do you think of such things? Well, it's a cinch. You just sit in the telegraph office for six hours and chew a pencil, and eventually you work it out. Pat, Hmm? uh, do me a favor while I'm away. Anything at all, baby. Well, when your next client comes in... Yeah? Soak him, clip him, clobberate him. I just saw a fur coat on Fifth Avenue. Well, I'll try, dear. Uh, I've got to call you later, darling. Here comes the client. Oh, I hope it's Rockefeller. Bye, baby. Bye, darling. Yes? Mr. Abbott? Yes? My name is Currier. 
This is George Curry. I'm from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I've heard a great deal about your ability as a private detective, Mr. Abbott. I flew up here purposely to see you. Well, what can I do for you? Perhaps you'd like to see this check? As you hmm. can see, Mr. Abbott, uh, it's made out to you. A $100,000. Oh, well, the check is perfectly good, except for the fact that I haven't signed it yet. I, I'm going to sign it, though, as soon as we make an agreement. What sort of agreement, Mrs. Carrier? I understand you're a very clever man. This is going to take all the ability you have, and then some. My husband just died, Mr. Abbott. Yes, go on. He was murdered. And you're offering me $100,000 to find out who killed him? Oh, no. No, I can tell you who killed him. Well, who did? I did. Now, just what do you expect of me, Mrs. Curry? I'm... I'm going to tell you all the facts. Retrace every incident of the crime. I'll cooperate with you in every way you wish. But I want you to see to it that it's impossible for the police to convict me. In other words, I want you to help me to get away with it. Oh, I'll be suspected. I'll be questioned. I'm sure of that. But I must not be convicted. It leaves quite a margin for your ingenuity, Mr. Abbott. Well, what's your answer? Are you going to throw me out of your office, or will you join me for cocktails? Well, Mr. Abbott, will you take the $100,000 to help me get away with murder? I'm sorry, Mrs. Currier. No, I will not. In the first place, I'm a private detective who operates on the side of the law. If your story is true, you can find a dozen small fry detectives. They'd be only too glad to help you skip a murder app. And they do it for a lot less than you're offering. Some of them would do it just for a good tip on the 4th of Santa Anita. But I wouldn't touch it. I'll make it $150,000. Uh, you don't seem to understand that it isn't the money involved. But let me finish. In the second place, I don't believe a word of what you said. This sounds to me as though, frankly, you're either out of your mind or playing some kind of practical joke. All right, Mr. Abbott, if you want to be very old-fashioned and highly moral about this, I, we won't discuss it any further. I was just thinking, though... Yes? Well, perhaps we could have cocktails anyway. Now, Mrs. Carrier, I'm sure it would be delightful, but uh, my wife... Uh... Oh, you're married? Yes, my wife just happens to be out of town... Um, well, that makes it perfect, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. Um... You are old-fashioned, aren't you? What are you going to do tonight? Play chess at the old men's club? Oh, I uh, just... Uh... I don't usually have this much trouble with men. Well, I can see why. There are some other better reasons that you can't see just yet, Mr. Abbott. Yes, well, I think you'd better go along without me, Mrs. Currier. Well, if you change your mind, I'll be at the champagne room. Hello, Jean? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Jean? Of course I can, Pat. Oh. Why do men feel they must scream into long-distance phones as though they were trying to throw their voices 3,000 miles? Well, I turned down her invitation, Jean. Oh, well, that's wonderful. That's very fine of you. And that's... But now I'm going to see her. Well, that's terrible. Well, she told the truth, Jean. It wasn't a gag. I have the latest edition of the paper here. Listen to the headline. Movie magnate murdered. George Currier stabbed to death on studio lot. Does the paper say anything else? Her 18-year-old daughter is mixed up in it. Her name is Margaret. So is her husband's partner, Leonard Benedict. Leonard Benedict? Mm hmm Well, don't they make quickie pictures? That's right. I've got to straighten this out, Jean. Well, keep your mind on the case, Bob, or I'll come home on the next plane and straighten you out. <laughs> Now, call me tomorrow. I'm going to the champagne room. Well, aren't you even going to tell me you love me? I love you. What? I love you. Just the line I want to hear, and now he doesn't shout, he whispers. Goodbye, Pat Abbott. <laughs> and like they say here on Broadway, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> you crazy, mixed-up detective. <laughs> I see you've changed your mind, Mr. Abbott. Yes, I just read the evening paper, Mrs. Currier. Then you're taking up my offer. Well, I don't want the money. I suggest you give that to charity. It'd buy a lot of food for those hungry youngsters in Europe. 
No, I'm here out of curiosity. I think I can answer all your questions. My husband was impossible. I loathed George. He treated our daughter Margaret horribly. Mm-hmm. Poor child was in a room every night crying her eyes out. George was a drunkard. He was promiscuous. He ruined the lives of a dozen people in Hollywood. Remember Tom Hopkins, the movie actor? Mm-hmm. He committed suicide because of George. Well, Mrs. Curry, I suppose you tell me the details of the actual murder. The other night I went to meet George at the studio on Gower Street. Mm-hmm. He was deserted. He was on the set by himself. We quarreled all week. I was miserable, and I was in a mood to do practically anything to get George out of my life. As usual, he was vulgar and nasty, and finally, he slapped me in the face. I, I couldn't take any more. I got terribly excited. There was a knife on the set. They were, they were using it in one of the scenes. I grabbed it. We struggled. Then George slipped, and I dug the knife into it. I was fortunate I was wearing gloves, so there weren't any fingerprints. No one had seen me come in. I sneaked out, took a cab home. That was that. Uh, Mrs. Currier, don't you think if you faced this and told your story to a jury, you'd be safe in risking clemency? Mr. Abbott, I have a daughter. Margaret's my whole life. I wouldn't drag her through a murder trial that cost me every penny I possess. Besides, if I were convicted, the child would be... If you'd have a mother who'd gone to the electric chair, that's why you've got to help me. We could fly to Hollywood on the next plane. Oh, I'm sure your wife would forgive you since you're going on business. Well, Jean is not the jealous type. Uh, not much. Uh... I think you'd like my place. I don't imagine you're often called in a case where you can mix business with moonlight swimming. <laughs> Hello, Jean. Go ahead, Pat. Where are you now? I'm in Hollywood. Well, tell Marilyn and Ava to calm down. There'll be enough to go around for everybody. <laughs> What's with the killing, dear? Well, I'll bring you up to date. From the airport, we drove to Mrs. Currier's estate. Oh, fancy? Oh, even a cocktail lounge is a cocktail lounge. Architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright. Interiors, Dorothy Draper. Three tennis courts, swimming pool. Shangri-La. These people have more money than Godfrey. Mrs. Currier introduced me to her daughter, Margaret, and uh, left us alone. Well, Margaret looked like a teenager on the cover of an expensive magazine. Margaret took me for a ride in her convertible. You didn't get along very well with your father, I understand, Margaret. Well, Mr. Abbott, to be honest with you, Daddy was a pretty tough problem. Uh-huh. Did you see him that night before he died? Uh, no. No, I didn't. See much of him at all? Frankly, no. I'm away at school a lot. Mm-hmm. When I'm home here in California, I like to spend my time my own way. And what's your own way? Oh, with my crowd. Our own kind of people and parties. Quieter get-togethers than the usual Hollywood brawls are? Huh? We get kicks our own way. What does that mean? You're a detective. You want answers? Figure them out. You strike me as being closer to your mother than your father. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? Was he such a bad boy? Egotistical. Well, he was too busy for me most of the time. Jungle tactics and business, all a pretty rough customer. Mm-hmm. I don't mind saying I never dug him at all. Hey, I'm going to turn here. There's one of my favorite spots down the street. I uh, heard you were going to college in the East next fall. That's right. You glad about it? Oh, sure. Gets me away from the moving picture crowd completely. How about your father's partner, Leonard Benedict? Uh, they get along with each other? Oh, very well. <laughs> it's odd, huh? You know, Dad was an ogre to everybody but Leonard. What are you stopping for? Well, this is the view I met. Here, get out of the car and come over here. That's it. Over here by the stone wall. Well, you get a great view of the Pacific at night. You think there's a more romantic spot anywhere? Well, I don't go around checking these things. Oh, you should. You look like the type. You got a boyfriend, Margaret? Oh, no one special. Particularly since most of the boys around here are just kids. I like men a little older than I am. Uh, like you, Pat. Mm-hmm. You're pretty childish yourself, Margaret. Well, how do you know? 
You picked up the adolescent notion that it's dramatic to chase older men, especially when they're married. What have you got in your head? A picture of yourself as a devastating husband stealing? Oh, I don't think it's that, Pat. Not at all. I just go after something I want, and I don't much care what's in the way. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why somebody knocked off your father. Uh, Maybe. Look, uh, can't we forget the case for five minutes? (laughs) Now you sound like your mother. You come from a very interesting family. Your father gets murdered, and you and your mother make it a field day. You always talk so much when you're alone with a girl. How many cases do you think I'd break if I weren't around making love to all the females involved? <laughs> a lot more than you do now. Oh, look at that moonlight on the Pacific. Isn't it dreamy? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, uh... I think we better get back to the house. We better get out of here fast. That's what I like about this spot. What do you mean, that's what you like? It separates the men from the boys. <laughs> You listening, Jean? I'm listening, but I'm not liking. Well, now you can see what I was up against. But I concentrated hard on the facts in the case. I wasn't responding to this girl at all. What did you say? This girl was getting nowhere with me. Oh, that's funny. I thought you said the girl was getting nowhere with you. That I could not believe. (laughs) Well, uh, I decided to pay a visit to that studio where George Currier was stabbed. The police had it locked up, but... uh, I got a pass and decided to give it the once-over. It was very late at night. The studio was deserted. The set was topsy-turvy. You could see there'd been a struggle. I found two glasses... One of them had a lipstick smudge. I put it in my pocket. I was going to see if it matched the brand Mrs. Carrier uses. While I was examining the bloodstains on the floor where George Carrier had died, I thought I heard a noise. I waited. Looked around. Didn't see anything. Then I heard it again. I turned my flashlight toward the back of the set. Then toward the cameras, the sound booth. Still saw nothing. Then as I was about to turn off the flashlight, I saw a face. A man was sneaking up behind me. What the... Sorry, Mr. Abbott. too, I found myself in a small, dirty bedroom. I could see headlights passing frequently by the window, so I knew I was near a highway. A man, extremely well-dressed and impressive-looking, was sitting by the bed with a gun in his hand. Allow me to introduce myself, Mr. Abbott. I'm Leonard Benedict. Uh, Mr. Benedict, what's the idea of bouncing me on the head with a blackjack? Oh, Ooh, that's quite a bump. I had no other alternative. I was afraid you might not come with me or listen to me. We're at a motel, Mr. Abbott, about 10 or 15 miles out of town. Mm -hmm. You're going to sit there and answer my questions, Mr. Abbott, or I'll put every one of these bullets into you. You're uh, George Currier's partner, aren't you? That's right, and you're working for his wife, who's trying to get out of the rap for having killed him. You're probably getting a fortune to rig it, too. No, I'm not getting a cent. I'm just interested in establishing what actually happened. You... You're not getting paid for it at all? No, she offered me a hundred grand, but I turned it down. If she's really guilty, I'll find out soon enough. And I'll be the first man to tell the DA about it, too. She is guilty. That's what you've got to believe. That's what you've got to prove. She mustn't get away with this. George was a wonderful man. I've been told quite differently. By, uh... Mrs. Courier? Yes, and Margaret. They made him out a combination Boris Karloff and Simon Legree. Well, he 
did treat Margaret pretty roughly. Uh, tell me, what's your stake in this, Benedict? Seeing that the woman who killed my partner dies for it. Mm-hmm. Get any ideas about how you prove it one way or another? So that a smart lawyer couldn't rip it to pieces in court. Motive, Mr. Abbott. In George's will, Mrs. Courier inherits half a million dollars. Wow. No wonder she was hiring detectives at 100000 a clip. Well, it still won't do, Mr. Benedict. We need scientific facts. Evidence you can get your hands on. That's your business. But listen to me and get this straight. I'll be watching you every minute. I'll be right behind you. And if you've been lying to me, if you're finagling around to fix this so that Margaret's mother gets away with it, I'll kill you, Mr. Abbott. As you can see, quite a cute predicament, Jean. If I nailed Mrs. Carrier for the crime, I'd ruin her daughter's life. If I didn't, Benedict would see to it that I was lying around somewhere with a little garden on my stomach. Well, I checked the lipstick on the glass I'd taken from the scene of the killing. Using a technique I'd been taught by a friendly pickpocket I once arrested, I lifted the lipstick from Mrs. Carrier's handbag, and at police headquarters, a friend, a chemist, gave me the report. Well, there it is, Pat. I mean, lipstick on that glass is the same brand that Mrs. Courier uses. Well, that doesn't tie this up in a neat package, though, Doc. Even though Mrs. Courier was at the scene of the murder, somebody else could have stabbed George. Yeah, but who? You know, Patrick, I've been wondering. Why did Courier leave all his money to his wife? Wouldn't he have left something to his daughter? He didn't get along with his daughter, Doc. Uh, maybe so. I know, I know. You've got a theory about murder once removed. In other words, Mrs. Currier is covering up. She didn't kill her husband. Margaret did. Well, Margaret could have figured it this way. She gets rid of her father. Her mother obviously gets the rap. Then little Margaret is left with a half a million. Ah, but she's such a sweet kid. Yeah, well, there's one way to find out, Doc. And I'm going to have a whirl at it. Oh? Well, what are you going to do? Lift a lipstick from Margaret's handbag, too. Sorry, Pat, you get nowhere. Margaret uses exactly the same kind of lipstick her mother does. Could mean she killed her father. Could mean she didn't. Yeah. All right, Doc. I didn't want to do this, but I've got one more card to play. Well, Pat, you still on the phone? Yeah. What are you going to do? What's this card you're going to play? I'm going back to see Margaret. Oh, I should have known there'd be an excuse for that. Now, look, I know George struggled with his murderer. And from dancing with you, I know that if George held on to a woman for a while like that, some of her face powder might come off on his suit. I have to get a sample of Margaret's face powder. From her boudoir, no doubt. No, 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 no. I'm going to take her out in her convertible again. Now, don't blow your top, Jean. Oh, I know it's all in the line of duty. I'm coming home on the next plane. Well, I, I promise to behave. It's my only chance to get that clue, dear. If anything goes wrong with that gimmick, I'll poison you, Pat Abbott. Good night. Good night, Lucretia Borgia. Well, Margaret, you're right. This is a beautiful spot. That moon. The view of the Pacific from this hill. Come here, Margaret. Mr. Abbott, I... Mr. Abbott. 
Yes, Mr. Benedict. I saw you drop Margaret at the house. Where are you going? To the morgue. You see, Mr. Benedict, I found out that both Margaret and her mother used the same lipstick. Therefore, the smear on the glass near George's body is useless, so I thought I'd try matching face powder. There's a powder spot on George's suit. I saw it in the morgue. I'll have a nice sample now of Margaret's powder here on my suit. You what? Uh, never mind how I got it. It's a burnt copper, see? I'm going to see if the two samples match. If they do, I'm sorry, but Mrs. Currier won't die for that murder. Her sweet little daughter, Margaret, will. You don't have to go to the morgue, Mr. Abbott. I was afraid that sooner or later you'd get to this point. You'll find the two samples do match. Oh, using your gun again, Mr. Benedict? Yes, it's in my pocket. Margaret killed her father, Mr. Abbott, and I helped her to do it. Now we're going back to the house, and we're going to kill you. Start walking, Mr. Abbott. Walk straight to the courier's house, and don't try anything. I just as leave shoot you down here on the street. <laughs> What the devil are you doing with that gun? Mr. Abbott, what's this all about? He got wise, Margaret. Get your things, sweetheart. We're leaving. I thought he was poking around too much. Leonard, put that gun down and listen to me. Margaret, dear, please. You've got to listen to your mother. I know you killed George. I hired Abbott to cover up for us. I thought the police would arrest me. Then Abbott would get me off and they'd never suspect you. I did it for you, Margaret. You did nothing for me. Nobody ever did. Lenny's the only one who ever cared about me. Then he taught me things. Then he showed me how to live. Oh, I hated it in this house. I wanted to get away with Lenny. Take it easy, Margaret, honey. Now, come on, get your things. You can hop a plane to Canada. These two will never talk. I'm going to fix that. I wanted that. to get away with Lenny. So we worked it out. We'd kill Dad, you would die for it. And we'd get all the money. The money he cheated Lenny out of in the first place. You wanted to do that to me, your own mother. Oh, there isn't time for playing hearts and flowers now, Mrs. Curry. Yes, I wanted to do that to you, because I'd do it to anybody that gets in my way. You're rotten, too. I know what was going on when my father was alive. And he knew what you were doing all the time, too, Margaret. That's why I couldn't stand you. You saw that hypodermic needle in your bathroom. Was dope one of the nice things Lenny taught you? Why, you... Why, you... Take it easy, Abbott. Get your things, Margaret. Hurry. I told you I'd take care of her and Abbott, too. You're not getting out of here, Margaret. I won't let you... Take your hands off me. Let go of my dress. I'll stop that. I'll shoot you. <gasps> Margaret. I... I didn't mean it. I... I meant to hit your mother. Margaret! You've killed her, Mr. Benedict. And I'll... I'll take that gun. That's better. You all right, Mrs. Carrier? Yes, Mr. Abbott. Now that it's all over... I'm all right. This isn't the way I hoped it would work out. This isn't the way I hoped it would work out. Oh, Margaret. Oh, Margaret. Hello? Hello, Jean. Operator. Operator. One moment, sir. Uh. Yes, Pat. Oh. Well, now you know the whole story, darling. Don't you darling me, Mr. Whatever your name is. <laughs> oh, I know what's bothering you. Did I have to kiss Margaret, huh? It's the only aspect of the case that isn't quite clear to me. Well, darling, how else could I have gotten that vital clue? I have two things to say to you. You're a brilliant detective and... Yes, and what? And I hate you. Well, that's a fine thing. The man is lonesome. His wife is away. Misses her terribly. Wants a few minutes on the phone to console himself, and she says, I hate you. Hate you? I loathe you. You should be shot at dawn, without a blindfold, too. Well, First I... rocket to the moon, very dangerous. You, you, they should put in a rocket. Oh, Jean, look, I, t I told you... Uh, hello? Oh, Jean. Jean, did you hang up? Can you hear me, Jean? Now look, will you stop this nonsense and tell me you love me? Jean, do you love me? 
Dean Abbott, do you love your husband? I am sorry, sir. We cannot give out that information. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as those popular personalities of detective fiction, Pat and Jean Abbott, created by Francis Crane. Tonight we were honored by Miss Claire Luce, making one of her rare radio dramatic appearances on The Adventures of the Abbots. Included in the cast were Barbara Glenn and Louis Van Ruten. The Adventures of the Abbots was written by Howard Merrill. Original music composed and conducted by Dewey Bergman. Produced by Ted Lloyd and Bernard L. Schubert. Directed and recorded by Harry Frazee. Next week, same time, same station. Another exciting adventure in crime with Pat and Jean in The Adventures of the Abbot. This is Wayne Howell speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome back. Here we get to see Pat kind of struggle with some of the uh, proprieties. Uh, this is actually a pretty uh, interesting case, the way that it moved. Uh, Claire Luce uh, appearing on the program um, was kind of interesting. She was actually towards the tail end of her career. Uh, she had had a long career on Broadway uh, that went close to 30 years and ended in 1952. Uh, very little uh, movie work, uh, some television work, uh, and actually in 1955 uh, she would actually uh, retire. She did two episodes of the TV series Matinee Theater uh, and then called it a career. So this was very late in a career from somebody who was best known for her stage work. I received an email from uh, Abala. Regard, uh, she writes, after hearing about this app countless times, I finally download it and am already enjoying it. Also, it was Sue Grafton who does the A is for alibi, B is for etc. I believe you said it was Mary Higgins Cl Clark. All in all, great shows. Well, thanks so much, uh, Abala. Um, and Lisa on uh, Facebook also caught the error, and so you are uh, you are correct. I misspoke. It was Sue Grafton, uh, and that was a few weeks back. Uh, back, I was comparing the naming schemes uh, of the Abbots, always having a color in the title, uh, to the uh, Sue Grafton uh, work. So that a uh, good catch there. And always appreciate uh, making sure we get that correct. Got a couple quick comments from Podcast Alley. Uh, thanks, Adam. Your show uh, helps my day go faster. And great job. Keep it up. Well, thank you so much for your kind remarks. We'll be back uh, tomorrow with Nero Wolf. And next week with another Great Adventures of the Abbot, features a, that, which will also feature a very special guest star. You want to be sure to listen. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know about Audible. Audible is a great service in which you can get one audio book uh, per month or a radio drama performance, such as the BBC's Doctor Who or the wide variety of Poirot stories, which were originally performed over BBC Radio 4. You get one of those per month and a discount on any additional set you might order. You can try it out free for two weeks by going to audiblepodcast.com slash oldtime radio. We're going to get into today's episode of Nero Wolf, The Case of the Bashful Body. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed in 30 seconds. The chimes are all set to wish you a happy new year this Sunday with a gala broadcast of the big show. The unpredictable Tallulah will MC with a host of leading stars of stage, screen, and radio, including... 
Ken Murray, Gloria Swanson, Margaret O'Brien, Jose Ferrer, and many more. And there's a carnival of fun with Theater Guild on the air also this Sunday when the sparkling Lockhart family, Jean, Kathleen, and daughter June, co-star with Van Heflin in Theater Guild's presentation of the exciting story, State Fair. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, I see. Oh, do you think Mr. Wolf might be interested in going over and... Hold on a minute. Archie, I'm not interested in going anywhere. Ill-considered movement is the curse of our times. Not to mention the mania for fresh air. Phew. Bottle opener, if you please. Here you are. But that was Zabro's flower shop, Mr. Wolf. Indeed. Got a new shipment of orchids from upstate. In that case... Mr. Wolf, remember the curse of our times? Not to mention the mania of... I'll be there. <laughs> He'll be there. After all, a man must risk his life sometimes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chairborn genius, Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Orchids don't grow up overnight. They have to be carefully planted, tended, watered, and watched. And the same thing goes for murder. Take Zabro's flower shop minutes after we got that phone call. Zabro! Uh, oh, Mr. Hansen, I did not notice you are here. I'm here, and what's more... You, you like the, the way I display your orchids, hmm? I don't like the way you've been avoiding meeting your obligations. Please, please, it is better not to shout. It'd be still better if you paid me what you owe me. Mr. Hansen, uh, business has not been so good. I will pay. You'd better. I, I intend to... My lawyers aren't going to be satisfied by intention. You, your lawyers? I've no particular desire to own a flower shop, but it looks as if I'm going to, unless you raise some money. <laughs> Mr. Hansen, I have worked years. I have given of my blood to make a success of this establishment. You cannot take him from me. You are a rich man. You... I intend to stay rich, too. You've got 24 hours, Abro. A man can accomplish a lot in 24 hours. Yes, Mr. Hansen. Even maybe murder. Mr. Zabro? Hmm? Oh, good afternoon, Miss Hansen. Is Uncle here? Yes, he is here. At the display, towards the back of the store. Oh, thanks. How is he? Oh, I, I mean, he, he is the way he always is. Hard, vindictive. Mr. Zabro. I am sorry. Excuse me now. Hmm. Uncle? What is it, Enid? I, um... Have you seen my display? The lilies? Uh-huh. Yes. Pretty. Oh, thank you. Uh... It... He's not here. Well, I didn't say... You didn't have to. John Arndt is not here. Why he is not here, I don't know. His job was to look after my display. Perhaps he doesn't need a job anymore. You know he does. Fiddlesticks. After all, if he marries my heiress... Uncle! My dear girl, John Arndt is a fairly capable man with orchids. Outside of that, I have no use for him whatsoever. Especially in the role of your husband. Well, isn't that for me to decide? Of course it is. Except that, pretty as you are, John Arndt is seeing you through a golden haze. To be precise, the money that will come to you from me when I die. That's nasty. It's the truth. Oh, you can't know that. <laughs> I'm going to find out. What? I saw my lawyers this morning. Among other things, I instructed them to draw up a codicil to my will. A codicil to the effect that all my money goes to you on one condition. Oh, you couldn't. I did. The condition was that you refrain from marrying John Arndt, either now or at any time in the future. Well, that's not fair. It's a very good way of discouraging Mr. Arndt. What will you bet his ardor cools off quickly, hmm? You, you told him? Yes. Probably why he hasn't appeared as yet. He's sulking. 
You really sign that, that codicil? I will, as soon as the papers are drawn up. Where are you going? I don't know. I've got to get away someplace and think. Very well. Think about forgetting John Arndt. Best thing in the world for you. Uncle, do you really think you can manage other people's lives for them? I don't see why not. No? Well, people don't like to be managed. They get desperate sometimes. And sometimes they kill. Uh, Mr. Wolf, what are you doing? Getting up. Mm. I'm a... Well, that makes you eligible for the Explorers Club or something. Ah, my coat and muffler, Archie. I got them here. Thank you. You're really going out into that... that weather outside? Archie, must you try to be witty? It amuses me no end. Haven't you seen enough of those weeds yet? An orchid is not a weed. Another muffler, Archie, the woolen one. You've already got two on. Please, fresh air clogs the lungs, Archie. (laughs) Sure, everybody knows that, but they won't admit it. Of course not. The conspiracy of silence. Archie, I'm ready. You sure? I can see a square inch of skin showing. Tom, you're driving me to Zabra. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, careful. And take a deep breath. I'm going to open the door. You ready? Yeah, very well. Open it. (laughs) Be brave, Mr. Wolf. We'll keep the car window shut, and maybe you'll make it. Mm. Uh, Careful. The risks one takes. Uh, in you go. Uh, uh, oh. Uh. Well. Okay, boss. Now, where is Zabros? 45th Street. Gee. <laughs> Ten blocks. Grit your teeth, Mr. Wolf. We're off. Oh, Mr. Wolf, I'm glad you are here. Those orchids you wrote me about had better be worth a trip. The trip? But I think you live only a little way from here. Don't forget it had to be made in the open air, Mr. Zabro. Where are the orchids? Uh, towards the back. They are from Hansen's place. He is a fine grower. I have made an exhibit. Good. Oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, others are here. You go look for yourself, no? Very well. Archie. Hmm? Oh, uh, I, I was just noticing the... Uh, the, uh, the did a girl the... just enter the store? A girl, a goddess. Tall, graceful... Venus de Milo with arms. Arms that were made... Never mind. Let's go look at orchids. Thank you. Mmm. Very fine. The exhibit is laid out like nature, huh? Reminds me of a spot in Central Park that I spent some of my happiest moments in. Then you do like flowers. I don't go to Central Park to look at flowers. I went there to, uh, Forget it. Gladly. Now go away and annoy someone else. Venus? I want to concentrate on these orchids. Goodbye. Okay. I'll leave you alone with your loved ones. Let's see. Maybe I can arrange to be left alone with something I could very easily learn to love. Hey, boss. Don't bother me, Haji. Oh, this is serious. There's a lily display just like this one over at the other end of the store. Nothing connected with lilies could possibly be serious. Maybe not, but there's a corpse planted among these lilies. Indeed? A lot of ferns were banked up in back of the display. I saw a foot sticking out, so I slipped back, lifted a few ferns, and found a body. Fresh? Very. The wound was still bleeding. Knife wound. Sad, very. Now run along. Aren't you going to do anything about it? Why should I? Anyone who'd permit himself to be found dead or alive among a display of lilies is beneath contempt. Well, maybe the poor guy didn't have a chance to crawl into an orchid display before he died. However, if that's the way you feel, I'll tell the police all about poor Mr. Hansen and let them... Who? Hansen, the orchid grower. He's one of the finest in the country. Not is. Was. Wasn't me who pushed him under the lilies. Under the lilies? Bah. He would have hated that. Have you told Zabro? No. No, Zabro's been busy up front. Uh, Where is this display? Ah, right along here. There's been a number of people in the store since we came. Someone else may have noticed that dead man's foot. Uh Uh-uh. I covered it. Satisfactory. At times, you give the illusions of intelligence. 
Is this the display? Yep. Come around to the back. There's a little space between the back of the display and the wall. Uh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here, right under this pile of ferns... Of ferns? Yes, Sergeant? Hey, that body. What about it? It got bashful. It's gone. Indeed. The corpse was dead. Corpse is off now. Confound you, Archie. Have you been drinking too much milk again? Now, look, boss. I saw him there. The blood's still coming out of his back. And I tell you that... Let me understand you. Are you suggesting the corpse rose and walked away? No, but somebody could have dragged it away. Somebody who put it here in the first place. Pictures, no doubt. Come along, Archie. If this is some half-witted trick to distract me from the orchid... Oh, no, no. I never come between a man and his love. Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. Yes? Do ferns bleed? Oh, let me see. Oh. Indeed. Yes, there is blood. Fresh arterial blood on these ferns. Bright red color. Which means there was a wounded person among these lilies recently. Thanks for the late vote of confidence. Hmm. Whoever killed Hanson apparently found a better place for him. Mm -hmm. Took him home to put him over the mantelpiece. Unlikely. Hanson wasn't very decorative. Okay. Now she'll look for the police. You have nothing to show them except a fern leaf covered with blood? No. Don't tell me you smell a fee among all these flowers. Hanson was a man I admired. Good heavens, Archie. The number of first-rate orchid growers is small enough without one of us being murdered. Mm-hmm. Unsportsmanlike, huh? Okay, we won't stand for it. What next? The body was removed from the building. How? Well, I wouldn't swear to it, but there's a window here that leads out to an alleyway. Could the alleyway be seen from the street? I don't think so. There's a bend in it. Wide enough for a car? Yep. Bring Zabu to me. Oh, don't bother. He's coming himself. Well, Mr. Wolf, what do you think of the... Mr. Wolf, I do not believe this. What don't you believe? You are looking at lilies. Not exactly. Whose flowers are these? Uh, Mr. Hansen's niece grows lilies. I see. Zabro, did you get all your orchids from Hansen? Oh, yes, yes. He is an artist. Practically an old master at the moment. How much money did you owe him? Who, who tell you I owe him? I... Uh, you do, don't you? Well, yes. Business has not been so good. But did he speak to you? No, I guess you owed him money. But I do not understand. Was Hanson in the store today? Yes, yes, he came. You hear us quarrel, eh? Where is he now? Oh, I do not know. He, he leave, maybe. I rather think he did. Zabra, who else was in the store within the last half hour who might have known Hanson? Oh, Miss Hansen was here, and uh, uh, John Arndt. He is Mr. Hansen's assistant, and how you say, uh, sweet on uh, Miss Hansen. Was she the tall girl came in shortly after we did, Mr. Zabro? Oh, yes, yes, I think so. Are either of them still here? No, 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 they go. Together? Uh, Miss Hansen go first. Very well. Come along, Archie. Okay, Mr. Wolf. Uh, you will not tell Mr. Hansen you know... You know of my debts. Uh, no, Mr. Zabro, I won't tell him. As a matter of fact, even if I wanted to, I don't think he would listen. I love these long drives in the country. Where are we going? Hanson's place. Oh. You think he returned to it to haunt it, huh? He was returned there, I suspect. Uh-huh. In order to cast suspicion on himself. Miss Hansen lives with him. Mr. Arndt works for him on the premises, therefore... Miss Hansen will be there? I imagine so. Why? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Boss, can we stop at the next town? Why? I want to buy a book on lilies. This sudden... In... <laughs> you mean Miss Hansen grows them in there? Uh-huh. See, that way we'll have something in common. Perhaps, but Archie, is an interest in flowers what you want to have in common with her? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the house that Orchid's built, huh? Snazzy. Very handsome country home. For streamlined zombies, I... Hello. I take that back. Miss Hanson? Yes. I'm Nero Wolf. 
The person ogling you is my assistant, Mr. Goodwin. Oh. Well, Uncle's spoken of you, Mr. Wolf. Oh, come in, please. Thank you. I was not ogling. I was merely tracing a resemblance. Oh, between Uncle and me? Between you and my heart's desire. Archie, stop being poetic. It doesn't become me. In here, please. My uncle isn't at home yet, but... Oh, John, this is Mr. Wolf, Mr. Goodman. John is uncle's assistant. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Hansen hasn't returned from town yet, Mr. Wolf. Are you quite sure? Why, yes. Unless Enid saw him. Oh, no, I didn't, John. Indeed. In that case, if you don't mind, we'll wait for him. Well, of course. We'd be delighted. Sure. Uh, excuse me, won't you? I've got some work to do. On orchids or uh, lilies? The orchids. Well, then go right ahead. See you later. Oh, well, uh, can I get you something to drink? Beer will do, thank you. I'd better help you bring the bottle in, Miss... Uh... Archie. On the other hand, maybe you can manage your lawn. Well, of course I can. I'm a big girl, Mr. Goodwin. I noticed. I mean, uh, uh, why not uh, Why not call me Archie? It takes less time. Hmm, I'd like to, Archie. Swell. Remember what old Dr. Tidmouse said? I want a bottle of beer. He said, I want a bottle of... Oh. <laughs> no, never mind, Enid. You better uh, go gather some beer for Mr. Wolf. All right. I'll be back in a minute. Mmm, so much of her and all so nice. Archie, are you I... forgetting why we are here? I don't care why you're here. Me, we I are have... waiting for Uncle. Uh-huh. Mr. Wolf, it's unlikely that Uncle is going to walk in through that front door. True. That is why you're sneaking out the back door to find him. How do you know he'll be around here? This is where he lives, isn't it, Archie? Yes, but if you'll remember, Uncle gave up living earlier this afternoon. You mean he was persuaded to? Nevertheless, I rather think he'll be around, body and all. He wasn't in the house, so I tried the conservatory, hothouse, what have you. It was hot in that steam-heated orchid paradise. Also, it was full of orchids. Unfortunately, it wasn't full of Miss Hanson. I wandered hither and yon for a moment, dreaming of her, until I noticed a foot... Same foot I'd seen back at Zabro's, and peculiarly enough, the same corpse was attached to it. Uncle's. I was bending over to take a closer look when I felt a thud. I realized that thud was the sound of something hitting my head, and I began to realize, too, that I'd been knocked almost unconscious, which the second blow did. understand where my uncle is, Mr. Wolf. He's staying away so late is unusual, then. Of course it is. Which reminds me, Archie's been gone for several hours. Yeah, where did he go, Mr. Wolf? Look about. Were you in the hothouse, Mr. Hunt? No, I was packing some plants. You, Miss Hanson? Well, after I brought your beer, I went upstairs and rested for a while. Why? Because if either of you harmed Archie, I shall personally murder you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Uh. Come on, we've got to find the boy. Why should either of us want to harm him? Because he probably found your uncle's body. His body? Huh? What are you... I don't understand. Mr. Hanson has been murdered. Oh, oh no. In it, in it. Oh, stop there, Miss Hanson. You're a perfectly healthy young woman. There's no reason for you to swoon. Now, look here, you. Besides, I rather suspect she lost no love for him. Am I right, Miss Hanson? He, he was my uncle. You're aware of the fact? He opposed your marriage to Miss Aunt here. That's none of your business. Which means he did oppose it. Mr. Aunt, Mr. Hanson was a friend of mine. I intend to find the murderer after I find his body. It shows a lack of proper respect to transport a corpse about the countryside. Come, both of you, we must find Archie. This whole thing's like a nightmare. If you can't wake up from it, let's go on with the search. Oh, oh look, they're on the ground. Arch. I'll, I'll see if he's alive. Why, this is fantastic. Mr. Hansen stabbed to death, and now Goodwin. He's oh. just been stunned, thank heaven. He's, oh. he's coming to. Oh, I died. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm dead. Archie? Archie, speak to me. Oh, I went to heaven. Are you all right, Archie? Uh oh, the other place. Ah, get up. Sure, if somebody will hold my head. Oh, this. 
Are we having an earthquake? You poor boy. Take my arm. Mm, I'll take both. Louie, he's normal. What happened, Archie? Somebody hit me when I wasn't looking. Yeah? Why? I don't know. Oh, yes, I remember. Yes? I found Uncle lying right there. Right there. The poor boy's delirious. Don't tell me he's gone again. I'm afraid he has, Archie. Are you sure you saw him? I'm positive, and then somebody slugged me. That corpse is the shyest one I've ever met. Blood would have dried. There'll be no signs of his having been placed here. Bad. Why? Your testimony would be valueless, especially since you were found unconscious. The jury would suspect you of having hit the bottle. <laughs> Why didn't we stay the night? I'm a sick man. Enid would have nursed me. Ah, you're not sick. And I won't have you taking advantage of that girl. In my condition, I couldn't have. But maybe she would have taken advantage of me. Oui. Is that what they call it in your day? The Zabro. Stop the car. Okay. Here we go. Mm. <laughs> No, I can manage it, don't... I'm not entirely helpless. Yeah. Place is closed. Dark. I was afraid it might be. Don't tell me Zabro's gone traveling, too. Possibility, Archie. You mean he killed Hanson to cancel the dead he owed him and then followed us out to the country house and dumped Hanson there hoping to, to pin suspicion on Eden and John? Perhaps. Uh-huh. Slugged me when I found the body too soon, and then... Uh-huh. Guess we'd better get into the joint. Door's locked? Um, a guy I know got out of jail the other day. Yeah? Uh, he's reformed, so he gave me all his skeleton keys. You have them with you? Mm-hmm. And we'll find out in a minute just how good a burglar he was. Mmm, very good. Will you come in? Shut the door. Okay. Now... Uh... What's that? Somebody's been hurt. The lights. Nothing up front here. Shh. Back of the store where the exhibits are. I'll go see. Maybe you better stay here. Nonsense. Oh, where? Uh oh, among the lilies again. But this time there are two bodies there. Sabro. Quick, Archie. Mr. Sabro? Mr. Zap? He's been shot, boss. Bad. He's trying to say something. The lilies. He's dark. Mr. Hanson. Yes, yes, we know about him. Who shot you? From the window. Alleyway. Came in. Mr. Zabro, who? He inherit money. Inherit. Down, Mr. Wolf, quick. Somebody shooting from that window. Uh, uh, uh. Archie. All in one piece. Are you all right? Yes, that car. It's gone. Brought the body here and... Zabra. He couldn't duck. He's dead. Yes. Police boss, this time we've got more than a fern leaf smeared with blood to show them. Not yet, Archie. I'd prefer handing the murderer over to them along with the victims. I'm going home. Archie, get Miss Hanson and Mr. Arndt there as soon as you can. Well, suppose they don't want to come. Knock them unconscious and drag them there. Not Enid, boss. Enid's... Hey... What Zabro said about inheriting. Don't anticipate, Archie. When you get them to my office, we'll identify the murderer then. Mr. Wolf, don't you think this is all a little high-handed, dragging us here in the middle of the night? Murder is even more high-handed, Mr. Arndt. Please, John. Miss Hanson, do you inherit? Well, well, I guess so. I'm, I'm Uncle's only relative, so I suppose... Wait a minute, Enid. Mr. Wolf, are you suggesting that she had anything to do with this invisible corpse? The corpse is no longer invisible, Mr. Arndt. You, oh, you seen, Uncle? Yes, dead, in Zabra's establishment. Lying with a knife in his back, in his own orchid display. Now you're trying to pin something on me. You know I set up that orchid display. Indeed. The police will be interested in that information. But he wasn't found in the orchids. He was... Yes, Mr. Arndt. He was found where? I, I don't know. You were about to say the lily display, weren't you? I wasn't going to say anything. You're a little late. You already informed us that you knew his body was not placed in the orchid display. 
How did you know? I, 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 I just guessed. The jury will be very much impressed by your remarkable clairvoyance. Especially since, uh, Archie asked Mr. Zabro to come in. Mr. Zabro? Okay. Don't bother, Goodwin. John, that gun. Shut up, you little fool. Enid's a big girl. I don't know how you tumbled, Wolf. Lucky guessing, maybe. Oh, come now. Neither of us has indulged in guesswork. You killed Hanson, placed his body in the lily display to attract suspicion towards Miss Hanson. You felt sure she wouldn't be convicted, so you were safe. She would inherit, you would marry her, a marriage which your uncle opposed. When you saw that Archie had discovered the body too early for you to establish an alibi for yourself... Then he sneaked the body out of the window into his car and then dumped it in the hothouse. For time. Go on, Mr. Wolf. He didn't intend it to be discovered there, which was why he knocked you unconscious, Archie. Oh, I'm so glad he had a good reason for it. He had a body on his hands. He decided to double back, put the body in its original place, and carry through his plan. But Zabro caught him at it, poor fellow. I thought Zabro was in the other room. Lost you, you fool. You think I, too, am addicted to carrying corpses about? Zabro is dead. And you've given yourself away unnecessarily, Archie. All right. Archie, quick. Let, let, let go, Edith. I've got his arm. I'll give him mine with a fist attached. Very satisfactory, Archie. Now call the police. Inform them you have two corpses and a murderer for them. You should have heard Mr. Arndt's language, boss, when the police took him away. Oh, I don't think he loves you. I don't think it matters anymore. It used to, to me. Growing pains. You'll get over it, Miss Hanson. Uh, you trapped him, Mr. Wolf, but what made you so sure he did it? At the hot house, when you were unconscious, Archie, Mr. Aunt deplored the fact that Mr. Hanson had been stabbed in the back. No one had mentioned how he was killed. Therefore... The reason Aunt knew was because he himself had killed Mr. Hanson. Hmm. Murderers seldom get away with it, no matter how tightly they button their lips. Hmm. Well, mine, however, are not buttoned up. Archie? Oh, the beer is on your desk. Thank you. Miss Hanson, stop brooding. Try some of this beer. But, Mr. Wolf, my, my heart's broken. As a man who has lived a good many years, Miss Hanson, permit me to assure you that the easiest way of mending a broken heart is by filling the stomach. <laughs> ah. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and G.G. Pearson, J. Novello, Herb Butterfield, and Byron Kane. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Deadly Sellout. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Friday means another visit with that entertaining eating establishment, Duffy's Tavern. Welcome back. Well, a very uh, fun and uh, uh, puzzling mystery. They have gotten Wolf out of the brownstone a large uh, number of times for so uh, short in the series. This episode, by the way, marks the end of the Lawrence Dopkin era as Archie Goodwin. We'll have a new Archie next week. Uh, for those of you who have been fans of uh, radio detectives, uh, it'll, I think it'll be somebody who is uh, familiar to you. Over on the Facebook page, I went ahead recently and I shared uh, an article I found by Lee Goldberg. Uh, it was one of the writers on Nero Wolf. Um, who uh, 
wrote about what it was like to write for the series. Uh, and uh, that's one of the nice things we can do over on Facebook. Uh, Sharon comments, it was a great series. I love Timothy Hutton as Archie Goodwin. And definitely uh, agree with that. Uh, we got another comment on Facebook which seems to have disappeared, but I wanted to address anyway as best from memory. A person was enjoying uh, uh, Nero Wolf, and he mentioned the series Broadway is My Beat. Uh, this is a it's a fascinating show, and we've got it on the list to do. Uh, like all of the uh, bigger shows, such as Richard Diamond, Nick Carter, and uh, Philip Marlowe, it takes a good space of time to do, because there's 163 uh, episodes out there. But it's fascinating and stylistically interesting, and it's got a great sense of poetry in the way that the narration is done by Larry Thor as uh, Danny Clover. So that's definitely a favorite, and uh, we will be bringing that to you uh, in due time. We do have one more comment for uh, po from Podcast Alley. I love the great detectives of old-time radio and Adam's comments. Real added value. Well, thank you so much. We'll be back tomorrow with Let George Do It, and next week, a brand-new Archie Goodwin for you. Well, before we get started with today's episode, I do want to encourage you to check out Tales of the Dim Night. It's a great superhero parody story paired with a fine family uh, story. You'll appreciate if you're a fan of classic superhero shows. Go to dimnight.com. You can read an excerpt or uh, purchase the book uh, either in paperback or ebook form. Well, today's episode of Let George Do It is The Empress of Fish Falls. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Empress of Fish Falls, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If life's crowding into a corner and you can't find your way out, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, I am a man who hears voices. No matter where I am, I always hear things, but it's always voices. Yesterday, my fortune teller told me... Oh, no. Violet, Brooksy. Overboard. Yes, but George, there are some more letters, and, and there's a lot of important mail here, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure, too. Everybody's sure. Oh, oh, boy. Oh, boy, did you see that fish? Wow. Three and a half pounds if he was an ounce. Hey, come on, give yours a pull, Riley. Yeah. Oh. Well, never mind the rest, Brooksy. Throw him overboard. Why don't you throw Miss Brooks overboard? It's bad luck, women in boats. Oh, it is, is it? Well, why don't you try putting a worm on that hook, Lieutenant? Look, we're doing the fishing, Angel. This is our vacation, not yours. Well, that's what makes me so mad, sitting back there in the hot city. But I knew you'd want to see your mail, George. I knew it was too important to wait, and I thought... Oh, yeah, sure, sure. You travel 500 miles for a man with three wives. Oh, but listen to this one, George. Listen to this. Dear Mr. Valentine, your name has been given to us as a likely prospect for the Fruit of the Month Club. What? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, brother. Well, at least now that I'm here, well, you wouldn't mind if I fished with you just for one day, would you? Hey, wait a minute. Hold it. Huh? I got something. Well, I'll swing it around. The lines are tangled. Yeah. Yeah. What you got, George? Yeah. Yeah. I got something. Huh? It's no fish. Come on, pull the boat a little closer. Uh, uh. Oh, no. Oh, it's the body of a little boy. Yeah. Only it's the first little boy I ever saw with gray hair. Well, I mean, that's the body of a midget. Uh. Well, he hadn't been in the water very long. 
12 to 24 hours, maybe. And it's pretty clear how he got there, isn't it? Yeah. Been shot through the back three times. How do you like that? On my vacation! Murder! Well, what's a midget doing in a place like this? Oh, he's getting on in years. Maybe he likes to fish, too. Well, it wasn't robbery, I'll tell you that. Huh? No, he didn't have a wallet or anything, but he's still got his watch. Beauty, too. Oh, let me see it, Joe. Yeah, that's a gold one. Hey, that's the kind that opens up on both ends. Uh, let me see it. Uh, there we are. Well, his name was Merle Bender. Read what else it says. Well, it says, To the greatest general manager who ever lived, Merle Bender, a little bundle of three-ring showmanship. Gratefully, Colonel Gerald P. Fargo. Fargo. Fargo Circuses. Yeah. Hey, I know that guy. Looks like our little man here was a big shot, doesn't he? I should hope to tell you. If Bender was general manager of Fargo's... Say, Valentine, we better get in touch with his boss, Fargo, right now. Yes, sir, and you'll need a crew out here and a fingerprint man and then... Uh, yeah. 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 This is your vacation, remember? Well, I only meant we'd get him started, that's all. We're just going up there to be uh, good citizens. these small towns. There's a deputy sheriff lives here, but do you think I could find him? No, no. He's gone all the way to the ocean today to fish. Lieutenant, what did you do with the body? Ah, uh, give it to the local sawbones. Calls himself coroner, too. I guess he's okay, except he was more worried about the empress's cold than he was about murder. The who's what? Uh, how should I know? It's that kind of town. I took a look at the bullet, though. South of 32 automatic, as sure as I'm born. And the uh, lieutenant... What are you going to do with that bit of information? I'm going to find me a telephone and dump it on the sheriff at the county seat. Now, here, let's let's try in here. Hello, strangers. What'll it be? Soda, cone, Sunday? No, no, I just want some change. That's uh, all. For the phone? Yeah. Haven't you got anything smaller than four bits? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Here, here, here's quarter. Quarter? Well, that makes it better. Half a dime to nickel plus 15 is 50. Well, I'm only calling the county seat. Why don't you say so? Give me back the nickel. It's huh? only 10 cents. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here, 10 sorry. 10 is 20 is 5. Yeah. Hey, you got your change, Mac. You're happy. I'm happy. Yeah, well, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, 5, 10. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got it all. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, you didn't learn that passing the walnut job in any country school, brother. Yeah, you mean I've been on the hop, Flair J? Me? No. I'll tell you a secret about me. Step a little closer, miss. Plenty of room for one and all. Huh? Now, watch my nose. What? Just keep your eye on the nose. A little freckle. Easy, yeah. does it? Oh, George, you're <laughs> swallowing it. Well, don't worry, lady. There's no danger. <laughs> there you are, back again. Now the years, you just time together like this. You're oh, no. Put... Hey, hey, <laughs> slow down, Buster. <laughs> okay, pull myself together. No money in it anyway. Here, have a Coke on the house. Oh, the time. My name's Rubberface, just in case you didn't guess. Hey, look, what kind of a town is Fish Falls? Everybody from the circus? No, no, only 20 or 30 of us. Wasn't, uh, well, there wasn't any two years ago. What happened, bad times? Bad? This? Oh, I've got a drugstore, miss. You ought to see me get the kids here. <laughs> no, no, we're all sort of retired. At least too old for the one-day stand. Oh, I get it. Oh, no, you don't. We're sideshow people. What's that? Sideshow people. Weirdies. It's not so easy to find a nice place to retire if you're a lady and got hair on your chin. Or you're a man with a battle of Bunker Hill painted all over you. Only here in Fish Fall, you're accepted, huh? Don't kid yourself. People point at other people any place you go. This town was like all the rest, until the Empress came along. The Empress. Now, there it is again. Who in the name is the... Greatest little old lady since Cleopatra bit the snakes. That's who I mean. And don't let anybody tell you different. Name's Merle Bender. And what? Don't interrupt, lady. She's got more money and she's got more class. Say, did you see the big castle down the river? Well, hey, that's where... Hold it, hold it. Isn't Merle Bender the name of a midget? Midget? Yeah. A man about 50, gray hair, heavy shoulders. No, no, no. Mel Bender, the Empress. Empress of Fish Falls. A little bundle of three ring showmanship. That's who she is. What, uh, what was it you desired to discuss with the Empress? That is, uh, what did you want to see her about? Uh,. About a gold watch. Well, I, I don't think the Empress would be interested in buying Yeah, now, look, Buster, there's something she should know. I just want to see the... 
Who are these people, elephant? Hey, what are you doing downstairs? Get back up there. I wanted to come downstairs, elephant. Go on. No. I think I'll stay downstairs for a while. Will you do as I... Oh, dear. Excuse me, Mr. Valentine. It's difficult enough being a butler when you're so fat you can't even hold the tea service, but... The inhuman sausage, they used to call him. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. She expects me to work with a footman like, like footman? this. Footman? Well, I should hope to... Golly, what size are they, 17? Triple A. I'm almost eight feet tall, too. My name is Elephant, so she calls him Castle. She does? Well, I'm very happy to meet you both. But look, I'm in a hurry and does I want... Does this man have a contribution for the hospital, Elephant? What? Oh, oh no, we just came here. Then and... I think they better go, don't you? I think I'd oh, like you better with them hey, gone. Hey, now, wait a minute, Lighthouse. Take it easy. I believe he's right for once, Mr. Valentine. Look, both of you, quit hey, pushing, hey, will you? You're asking for it, Dean. Stop. Stop it. Stop it, all of you. Stop it. All right. Come in, young man. I'll give you two minutes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Empress. My name is Mrs. Bender. Yes, ma'am. My husband was a lion tamer. God bless him. Sit down. Sit down. Hey, you know, you're certainly hard to see, Mrs. Bender. Don't be insulting. I'm easy to look at. Oh. Or at least I was once. You're attractive, my dear. If you'd use just a little darker lipstick. Well, thank you. Uh, but you see, I... Yes, I know. Your name is Claire Brooks and you're George Valentine. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Well, look, we came to tell you... you tell me about a midget, yes. Yeah. Shorty MacDonald. I knew him years ago in Carnival. He came here just last night. His little car is still out there in the garage. He said he was looking for a place to settle down. Wanted me to help him. Did you? Well, I'm very busy just now collecting money for a hospital drive. But, of course, I told him to wait, to stay here. We'd find something in a few days. Well, then what happened? That's all. Last evening, he said he was going to take a little walk down by the river. Uh-huh. Well, we pulled him out of the river this morning with three bullets in him. But I suppose you know that, too. Naturally. Okay, do you know about the watch? Uh, perhaps. Your watch. The one the midget was carrying when he was killed. The one Colonel Fargo must have given you when you were manager of his circuses. Oh. Oh, yeah. Those were the days. Well, how did the midget get the watch? Did he steal it? Aren't you forgetting you're on your vacation? Ah. And that man with a gorgeous temper who's with you. I suppose he has questions to ask, too. Mrs. Bender, Oh, you... I've seen you out there on the river through my opera glasses, wasting your time using spinners. Look, Mrs. Bender, there's been a murder. Do you think I'm not aware of it? Shorty was a lovely little man. I gave him my watch to take into town for repairs, that's all. The police of this county will manage quite well without interference. Look, Mrs. Bender, we only want to We know. To help. We appreciate what you've done most sincerely. But your two minutes are up now, Mr. Valentine. I hope you catch lots of fish. Goodbye. I know, I know. I got the same treatment. I got the bounce, too. And the sheriff? He says he's got his orders, and now he's got the case. Thank you, and good night. Well, the old lady seems to run this county just like she must have run Fargo Circus with a tiger whip. That's what she thinks. I uh, got a wire in answer to the one we sent Fargo. Here, look. Yes, uh, Lieutenant Roddy, Fish Falls, California. I have never heard of anyone in show business by the name of Merle Bender. What? Who is taking you for a sucker this time? Sign Colonel Gerald P. Fargo. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in a moment. Maybe you think your car gets its rest at night, same as you do. But your car's engine is subject to its worst beating when your car is idle. As soon as you cut the ignition, acid-laden moisture condenses, starts to attack internal engine parts. 
The result is corrosive rust, which causes 80% of engine wear. But if you're using RPM motor oil, relax. RPM, a premium quality oil, is compounded to keep a moisture-proof film on all internal engine parts. Even if your car stood idle for days or weeks, RPM's adhering agent would keep this protective film on vital parts. Without this special ingredient, oil couldn't do this wear-saving job. The oil would quickly drain off internal engine parts. So, depend on RPM motor oil, the oil that stops 80% of engine wear. Ask for RPM at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations, where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Back to tonight's adventure, George Valentine. You go on your vacation to catch fish, only instead you pull from the river the body of a midget. You meet a woman who calls herself the Empress of Fish Falls, a woman who pretends to have been a great lady of the circus, a woman who tells you to peddle your papers. But if you're anything like George Valentine, when a real authority in the circus world wires that he's never heard of anyone by her name, you begin to wonder and check around. And so, uh, all you've met is the minority group, the uh, so-called freaks, eh? Well, that's why we came to you, Mr. Grote. You're the town banker, and we thought you would... You know, we didn't cotton to them much when they first started coming here. It's a small community, conservative and so on. Rubber Face suggested that the Empress help change that attitude. Oh, not directly. But, of course, she knew them, accepted them. And what would be more acceptable than a woman like her? You mean because she's so wealthy? Well, since the Empress has been here, this county has improved itself more than in the last ten years rolled together. Oh, roads, mobile, libraries, and now the hospital. You mean she contributes all the money? Oh, she works her time on every committee, a regular dynamo. And I assure you she's offered to do a bit of underwriting any time the county fails in its quota. I suppose she banks with you? Yeah, well, now, see here, if she was rude to you, I'm sure it was just that she's so busy. This time she heads the committee, you understand, the position of trust. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, what we're interested it's in is... It's her job to visit the farms or to be at home to accept the money. Now, it's her job to see that... Uh, to see... Uh, well, what's the matter? You mean Mrs. Bender is collecting money from people in the county herself? Well, that, that's the way it's done. It's a rural area. Uh, this is the big weekend. Much money? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Just, after all, it's a hospital. Uh, Mr. Grote, how do you know Mrs. Bender is what she seems to be? Get out of here. Huh? All of you, you're insulting a noble woman. And you're insulting my judgment of character. I won't be bothered by a bunch of outsiders. Dead. I sure, miss. There's nothing I haven't done in my time as a thinker. I've been a barker, a lumber gym. I was even a rider in the manager. Well, Rubberface, I suppose you knew most of the other circus people in those days. Uh, gosh, you make a good soda. A Rubberface special for you, miss. Always snap back for more. <laughs> well, I mean the people who live here in the town now. You knew them in those days, didn't you? Yeah, some of them. The others came from foreign shows, some from Connie. Like that midget got killed short of McDonald's. He was a Connie, oh. so he switched to Vaudeville in a double act. Uh-huh. But, uh, well, I mean, I suppose you knew the Empress in those days, didn't you? Did I? The Empress? What? Drink up the soda, miss. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You got it. And the address is just Billboard Magazine, New York City. Yeah, I'll wait. Hello, Mr. Valentine. Well, hello, elephant. I couldn't help hearing. That is, uh, noticing. Friends on Billboard get you good publicity in show business. I never what are you had... doing? Following me? Of course, maybe you don't have friends. Maybe you're just asking Billboard for information about people. It's a free country. I really doubt if you do have many friends prying like that. Why don't you cut the double talk? I never got good publicity, even if I was one of the heaviest in the personal class. Look at those hands, Mr. Valentine. 
Like loaves of bread. Yeah, you look at them. It's a funny thing about fat men, though. They move fast. Wait a minute. Take your hands away from me. Let me go. Too close to hit, uh, Mr. Valentine. You won't try anymore, will you? Hey, my stomach. Stop squeezing. Cut it out, Chrissy Bear. Cut it out. You'll be all right, Mr. Valentine. They'll you... find you here in the alley. You'll be all right, but you won't. You are. Will you? There's a hospital drive going on. You leave us all alone. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Of course you will. <laughs> I guess now you'll buy something's wrong in Denmark, won't you? Even from an outsider? But I, I don't know, but the fat man might have killed but him. Try to drink this water, George. Oh, no, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm all right. Yeah, sure. Like bologna in a meat press. Hey, just squeeze me around the stomach till I passed out. Yeah, I'll take that water. Yes, well, I've known her for some time, Lieutenant. I, I've trusted well, her. Well, you can ask to see the hospital money, can't you? No one else would know she has it there at the house. I suppose they think it's in my bank already. The early contributions are. I, I always felt there was no danger. Her two men there. Mr. Grote, you wouldn't look well holding a sack. Oh, the sheriff will be back here soon, but... Yes, 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 I'll go with you. Well, that's more like it. Valentine, you able to travel? Yeah, Riley, I'm miles ahead of you. Let's go. <laughs> is Grand Central Station. I tried to keep them out, Mrs. Bender. I tried oh, quiet, to... Oh, quiet, Castle. I... Just what is the meaning? Well, sorry to come barging in on you like this, Mrs. Bender, but... Uh, we... Yes, but there's a little matter of money involved. Well, speak your piece, banker. Why, Mr. Grote, I... I didn't know you associated with outsiders these days. Well, it... It, it pains me, Mrs. Bender. No, it really does, but, well, it... It was in regard to the hospital fund collection. Oh, but of course. I should have guessed. You'll be pleased to know that I have nearly all of it. I'm within $72 of reaching the quota. Oh, but but that's fine. Yes, uh, people have been coming up here all day bringing money, haven't they? Uh, Where do you collect it? Your desk there? Get out of here. Get out of here right now. Mrs. Benina, please. Yes, it's just that we thought it would be best. I mean, now the money is almost in, and in the light of the murder and all that. But if I moved it to a safer place, I can open my bank at night. How dare you? How dare any of you come up here? Suggest Excuse me, Grandmother. But you're a fake. You're a fraud. I'm a what? You're supposed to be big in the circus world, but nobody big in the circus ever heard of you. Why? You're supposed to be a wealthy woman, but the financial world never heard of you. Mr. Grove. There was a gold presentation watch with your name on it handy for showing to the yokels to impress them with your importance. What do you mean? Well, I'm afraid it's the oldest confidence game in the world, sister. To move out to the sticks and set yourself up as the grand dame until you and your boys could collect on the big charity hall. But the party's over now, sister. It's time to... Party! Party! I didn't get an invitation. That's so, so you're back again. But I'd be glad to show them my tricks. Don't worry, Empress, I'll take care of you. I'll do it too, Empress. Oh, boy, don't! Stand don't. still, all of you. Yeah, nobody's bigger than a gun. Now, for the last time, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bender, but I'm going through your desk. No, please. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. The cupboard was bare, hello, Tim. Yes. Yes, it's gone. Cash, check. What do you mean? It's been stolen. I just found out. I've been sitting here wondering what to do. Stolen, huh? Everything you've said about me is true. Except one thing, Lieutenant. I wasn't planning to swindle. It was to help people. Yes, that's true, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Grote is known, of course. He's the only one except for the circus people. You see, I was a thinker of a sort. For 35 years, I was a wardrobe mistress. Since then... Well, I, I've just been using the things I learned in life, that's all. I've been what I never was able to be in the circus. An empress. Even if it's only in fish falls. Oh, Mrs. Bender, why didn't you say so in the first place? Well, oh, skip it. I... I know you thought the sheriff could figure out Shorty's killing without anybody getting wise to your game. But don't you see? Whoever took the money knows it. Knows what a nice pantser you make. You see, even Mr. Grote here began to dodge. And whoever took the money knew about where to find it, too. And that cuts us down to size. About the size of this room. What? 
Oh, but the boys are from the circus. My kind of people. There are bad apples in any barrel, Mrs. Bender. I remember your midget friend moved into your house last night. Well, he also moved into the killer's setup. That wouldn't have made much difference if the midget hadn't recognized him as a bad apple. Oh, but no one knew Shorty here but me. Oh, indeed. I, I'd never met him. Me neither. Oh, no. Well, it doesn't make much sense unless one of you is lying. Shorty McDonald had been in a carnival, and he did a double act in vaudeville. And the only double act in vaudeville for a midget that I ever heard of is... Low and high. Yeah. The midget... And the giant. Oh, wait a minute, Empress. There's no reason for everybody to look up at me. The elephant here, he's just as likely as I am. He was the one trying to squeeze the man to death, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. The big boy put me on, all right. But maybe he was just being a little overzealous and trying to protect the Empress's secret. He's always like that. He's too strong here. Why don't you shut up, Beanpole? Shorty McDonald wasn't squeezed. He was shot. And can you imagine the elephant here sticking one of those sausage fingers of his into the trigger guard of a pistol? It wouldn't work. He couldn't do it. He couldn't fire a gun. Sure, there's lots of things he can't do that I can do. Things nobody can do that I can do. See, I could fire a gun, couldn't I? Now, is he? No. You could shoot yours and I could shoot mine and lots of people would be killed. I said put it down. The sheriff will be here and you'll be... I don't want to kill lots of people, do I? I'm going to run away, Empress, but I'll take good care of your money. Don't worry. Crazy. Goodbye, Lieutenant. I'll go out the back way. There's a car in the garage. If the sheriff comes to the front, he can get out the back road. Get away. He won't get away. Let him go. What? Let him go. Now, don't worry. Getting away is one thing he can't do. Remember, Empress? The only car in the garage belonged to the midget. And it's a midget car. Come on, Riley. Let's take him. Well, here you are, Empress. The giant's all tucked away, and uh, here's your hospital money. All oh, but that's 72 bucks, of course. Seventy-two dollars, oh, yes. Mm. Uh, just one moment, Lieutenant Riley. Mm? Is it customary for a police officer on vacation to carry a gun? Huh? Oh, well, I just happen to have it with me, that's all. Oh, yes, of course. Did. You brought it along for snakes, huh? Uh, mm? <laughs> Lieutenant, I do appreciate your promising to keep my secret. But I'm sure you'll understand me when I say that I still need seventy-two dollars. The hospital fund. Oh, you—you you, you mean you? <laughs> you mean just because I'm in civilian clothes and carrying my gun? Empress, what kind of a blackmail is this? I said you had a gorgeous temper the first time I saw you. Oh. Here's my fountain pen, sucker. <laughs> George? Mm. Why is it that murders always happen to detectives everywhere they go? Oh, I don't know. Because life is like the movies, I guess. Yeah, but George, uh, what I mean is, uh, would you hold this pole? The line seems to be stuck in huh? Hey, give me that. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right, Foxy. Huh? Yeah. We've hooked onto a fish. You're driving in city traffic. You're on a slight upgrade and you come to a stoplight with a line of cars right behind you. The light turns green and you want to pull away fast. You make it all right, but your car's engine does a lot of knocking. What you want, mister, is Chevron Supreme, the gasoline that gives your car ping-free power. It's specially blended to burn evenly to give your car better performance under every driving condition. Faster starts, smooth, quick pickup in traffic, extra power on hills. And depend on Chevron Supreme for ping-free power wherever you drive in the West. It's climate-tailored for each different temperature and altitude zone. In fact, for today's high-compression engines, you can't buy a better gasoline. Get it at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say, and mean... We take better care of your car. Next week, when we come upon George Valentine and Brooksy as they're doing a little professional snooping in the dark, we'll hear... What'd you find out, Brooksy? Nothing, George. Nothing that would indicate it. But I don't... 
don't know exactly what I expected to find. Oh, yes, you do. George? What do you suppose he did with her? I don't know, I don't know. He looks like the trunk or hatbox type. And if I'm right, we're going to find her, Brooksy. Somewhere. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Verna Felton as the Empress, Eddie Marr as Rubberface, Alan Reed as Elephant, Ed Max as Castle, and Howard McNear as Grove. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, I note last week's uh, uh, teaser for this week's episode was a little bit uh, was a little bit different when they actually got it into the series, uh, um, which is kind of odd, I guess, because I'm used to uh, modern shows when they do previews. Uh, they're doing previews of shows that have already been uh, recorded, but in the case of uh, let George do it. The radio session had not been done. And, of course, uh, Lieutenant Riley wasn't in last week's uh, preview. Of course, Alan Reed was in this episode, and I've actually been running into him a lot in my radio listening recently. Just remarkable how much he did uh, in radio, such a you know, wide variety of different roles, uh, usually. You know, most folks, if they know him at all, they know him as Fred Flintstone, but it was a much wider spectrum of roles he took on, on nearly every radio program uh, you can think of. And Ed Mox, uh, who uh, played the uh, uh, killer in this one, uh, also did the voice of Gallagher on uh, Voyage of the Scarlet Queen. Some familiar voices in this one. I do have to wonder if there really was any sort of law that would punish an off-duty uh, police officer for carrying his uh, weapon out of town, whether that was based on an actual state law or just something they made up. I'm somewhat thinking the latter. Well, I do have one comment from Podcast Alley, and it's just a simple good commentary. Well, thank you so much for your comment. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know about Netflix. Netflix not only includes uh, DVD plans, but also a wide variety of instant watch programming. I'm going to answer an email in the second half of the program, and Netflix actually helped me get the answer quickly. I got a question about a, an adaptation of Sherlock Holmes that I have not actually seen since I was 9 or 10 years old. So to comment intelligently would be a bit of a challenge. But thanks to the Instant Watch, I was able to add it and watch it, and watch it, and now I'll be ready to comment after the show. The Instant Watch includes a wide variety of classic and modern shows, including uh, TV shows, including Monk, The Rockford Files, and many great classic movies as well. You can try Netflix out free uh, by going to netflix.greatdetectives.net. But let's go ahead and we'll get into today's episode... The Adventure of the Sally Martin. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, 
Now, once again, it's time to keep our weekly appointment with that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting you. Of course I am, Mr. Bell. So come in, draw up your usual chair, and make yourself comfortable. <sighs> ah, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Watson. What story are you planning to tell us tonight? Quite an exciting one, I think. Well, the only relic I have of it is this rather mildewed piece of paper. I came across it just before you arrived as I was going over my notes on the case. Look, this doesn't look very exciting. It's a hotel bill, and all it says is board and lodging for one week, 28 shillings and sixpence. <laughs> then there's an extra item, one pint of ale not paid for, five pence. And yet that extra pint of ale was ordered at the very moment when Sherlock Holmes and I entered into one of the weirdest experiences we ever had. I call it The Adventure of the Sally Market. Before you begin the story, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... Uh... Have a word with our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> of course not, Mr. Bell. Men, if you want a successful, prosperous appearance, don't give your hair that cheap, greasy, plastered-down look. Many products advertise that they don't leave the hair looking or feeling greasy. But let's make this test. Run your hand over your hair. Does your hair feel greasy or sticky? Now look at your hand. Is there a greasy film on it? If there is, then you certainly are not using Kremel hair tonic. Because Kremel positively never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Kremel contains a very special hair grooming ingredient found in no other hair tonic. It makes dry, unruly hair stay in place longer. Gives it such a nice, healthy-looking luster, too. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand over your hair and no grease comes off. Notice, too, how delightfully clean your hair feels. And just see if the ladies don't like that natural, well-groomed look which Kremel always gives. Try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the adventure of the Sally Martin? Well, the story began many years ago in the tiny fishing village of Kingsgate on the Kentish coast. At my insistence, Sherlock Holmes had agreed to take a much-needed holiday. And we were staying for a few days at a small seaside inn known as the Silver Dolphin. The adventure began, I remember, on a foggy, bitterly cold evening. Holmes and I, after a hearty dinner, were seated in the public bar of the inn talking to a garrulous old sailor. Little did we think that even in that peaceful village, dark tragedy was stalking us. Tragedy that very soon was to be brought to our attention. Here you are, Albert. Another pint. Thank you, Condy, sir. Ah. Yes, you're very good health, gentlemen. Oh, amazing capacity. That's the fifth. I can't think where he puts it. I see no mystery there, Watson. Go on with your story, Albert. You just reached the point where the shark had turned on you. Ah. Well, gentlemen, I acts on the rail and dives into that raging sea. Pulls out me knife. Oh, really? Uh, where did you get the knife? I thought you said that you'd lost your clothes in the hurricane. Stepped to me middle, I was. But I always kept a barry knife stuck in me belt. Oh, really? How uncomfortable. Well, I see the white belly of the shark turning at me. I let him have it. Uh, a rip here. A slash there. Ooh, there was blood all over the place. Never saw such a mess. Uh, Storytelling's very dry work, gentlemen. I'll order you another pint, Albert. Uh, thank you, can't you, sir? Watson, look who's just come in. Well, it's our old friend Sergeant Dobson, isn't it? Yes, and judging by his expression, the local representative of the law has serious business on his mind. Good evening, Sergeant. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Evening, Dr. Watson. How are you, Dobson? <laughs> can I have a word with you, Private Lake? Of course you can. Oh, I beg pardon, sir, but uh, you did say something about buying me another <laughs> pint. <laughs> Don't worry, Albert. We'll have it sent over for you. <laughs> Please give Albert another pint, Annie. Put it on my bill. Right you are, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps you wouldn't mind stepping into the private bar, gentlemen. Very well. Now, Sergeant, sit down and tell us what's on your mind. Murder, Mr. Holmes. Great Scott. Who? Where? Well, have you gentlemen noticed the fancy sailing boat that's been moored out in the cove this past week? Yes. I was informed that it was owned by George Byron, the Lancashire cotton manufacturer. Uh, that's correct, sir. The boat's named the Sally Martin. And right at this moment, Mr. Byron's lying there in his cabin with a knife in his ribs. Deader than a boiled mackerel. Good gracious me. I rode ashore to send a telegram to the police at Canterbury. But I left a constable to guard the people aboard. Good. I, I'm going back now to conduct my investigation. But the Canterbury police can't be here for morning and I... I was hoping that... That we'd help you, Sergeant? Well, sir, a case like this is a little outside of my experience. Uh, just a minute, Dobson. Mr. Holmes is still a sick man. 
It's cold out and foggy. As is doctor, I forbid... Rubbish. Oh, How can I stay here in the inn while a murder lies waiting to be solved less than a mile away? Come, Watson. The game's afoot. Oh, how much further is it, Sergeant? About a, about a quarter of a mile, well, sir. If you don't get there soon, I won't answer for the consequences. I'm a rotten sailor. Cheer up, Watson. In the meanwhile, Sergeant, suppose you give me as many facts as possible. How many people are aboard the Sally Martin? Well, there's three passengers, Mr. Holmes, and, and two in the crew. Well, let's have those passengers first. Well, there's, there's Mrs. Byron, the dead man's wife. A lot younger than him, she is, and, and she looks a bit on the flighty side, if you ask me. Even though she was having a proper bit of hysterics, like... And then there's, there's Clarence Byron, the dead man's brother. And what opinion did you form as to his character? Well, sir, you understand I didn't talk to him much. But he acted cool as a cucumber, just, just as if murder didn't mean a thing to him. And the third passenger? Well, he's a young fellow by the name of Hodgson, secretary to the dead man. Very nicely spoken gentleman he is. But it seemed to me as if Mrs. Byron had quite an eye for him, even, even through her tears. That's why I said she seemed flighty-like. You're very observant, Sergeant. Oh, it's, it's just training, sir. How about the two crew members? Well, there's, there's Captain Small. And he seemed perfectly above board. And a, a man by the name of Coggins. Arthur Coggins. He's a, he's a deckhand. And a mighty surly one at that. <laughs> he gave me quite a bit of back chat when I questioned him. Holmes, oh, how much further is it? Barely a hundred yards, old chap. Oh, I feel awful. Do hurry up. Move over, Sergeant. Let me take an oar. There's the murdered man, Mr. Holmes. That's just how we found him. Very illuminating. Look at that murderous knife. It's buried to the hilt in his chest. Yes, but more interesting than the knife at the moment is the tableau presented in this cabin. What story does it tell you, Watson? Well, a simple story. Somebody opened the cabin door, came in, and stabbed him. Oh, come now. Surely our years together have made you a little more perceptive than that. Well, that's what you're driving at. Well, for one thing... In his right hand is an open book. Oh, been reading? Yes, and the sergeant has told us that the oil lantern beside his bunk was still burning when the body was found. Oh, that's right, Mr. Holmes. There's no sign of a struggle. The bedclothes are in, aren't even rumpled. No cry for help was heard. So let us reconstruct the scene. Mr. Byron was lying in his bunk, reading, as you observed, Watson. Oh, quite easy. The door opens. The murderer comes in, the knife hidden in his or her clothing. The victim has no suspicion of his fate because the murderer was someone who could enter his cabin at will. And suddenly... The fatal blow is struck. Then it must have been one of the three passengers. I think we may reasonably include the captain. The master of a schooner surely would have the ability to enter his employer's cabin without creating suspicion. Oh, you're right, Mr. Holmes. I think we've seen enough here, Sergeant. Where are the passengers? In their cabin, sir. I told them to wait there until they were sent for. The main saloon's empty. You could see them in there nice and private-like. Splendid. Then let's go there. At once. <laughs> My friend's only trying to help you. Oh, how can he help me? He can't bring poor George back to life again, can he? No, madam. <laughs> but at least I can try to find his murderer for you. He's right, madam. So take it easy, like, and answer his questions. Very well. Uh, what do you want to know, Mr. Holmes? Can you suggest anyone who might have had the motive for murdering your husband? Oh, half a dozen men. George made a lot of money. He was a hard businessman. He had many enemies. But none of his business enemies had an opportunity of killing him tonight. His biggest enemy, though I never could make him believe it, is on this very boat now. His brother Clarence. Biggest enemy? His own brother? Oh, come, 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 it's madam. True. It's true. Clarence sponged on him. That's done for years. And ever since I married George, he's tried to be more friendly to me than a brother-in-law should be. Mm -hmm. Just because I was once in the theatre, he seems to think I didn't know how a lady Oh, you, you were in the theatre? I wonder if you knew a girl who was dailies. Pretty little figure. And then Watson, the... surely this is no time for your theatrical reminiscences. Oh, well. Mrs. Byron, are you familiar with the terms of your husband's will? Everything he has comes to me. Oh? Well, that's perfectly natural, isn't it? Perfectly. But in that case, your brother-in-law would hardly seem to profit from your husband's death. I don't know what you're suggesting, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. If you think I stabbed him, I wouldn't have had the strength. Mrs. Byron, I suggested nothing. 
but I'm interested to notice that you answer your questions as well as ask them. Well, I'm not staying here to answer any more questions, Mr. Holmes. I'm going back to my cabin. If you want me, that's where you find me. No, wait a minute, ma'am. Let her go, Sergeant. And please ask Mr. Hodgson, the secretary, to come in here. Just as you say, sir. Well, upon the soul, she's a fine little thing, isn't she? That's attractive, too. What do you make of her, Holmes? It's hard to say. If one wished to deduce motive, it would be easy. Well, she must be 25 years younger than her husband. And uh, a fortune coming to her. It is death, eh? Precisely. And despite her own statement, a woman would have the strength to stab an unsuspecting man to death. Here's Mr. Hodgson, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Please sit down, Mr. Hodgson. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This is a shocking business. It is indeed, my boy. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Any questions you like. When did you last see your employer tonight? Mm, shortly after dinner, Mr. Holmes. He was taking a turn round the deck. We chatted for a few minutes, and then I went to my cabin and retired. It was about 9.30 or quarter to ten. You heard no cry for help? No shout in the night? No, none. The first I knew of the tragedy was when the captain awakened me. Can you suggest who might have had a motive for his murder? Mr. Holmes, that's... that's a little hard to answer. Come now, Mr. Hodgson. Don't hold anything back. You'll have to talk in a court of law, you know. Yes, I suppose so. Well, gentlemen, in my capacity as secretary, I did know that my employer's brother, Clarence, has been borrowing heavily. Only yesterday morning I was compelled to draw my employer's attention to an irregularity in the monthly bank statement. A 500-pound check had been drawn. The signature was a forgery. And you think that Clarence Barron committed that forgery? Yes, I do, sir. And so did my employer. The two brothers had a terrible row about it. Uh, Sergeant... Will you be good enough to ask Mr. Clarence Byron to come here, please? Right you are, Mr. Rowe. One very personal question, Mr. Hodgson. Was the relationship between you and your employer's wife a purely social one? As a matter of fact, Mrs. Byron has been very kind to me. Oh, really? My family are dead and she's taken an interest in me. But I give you my word that it's been purely platonic. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Hobson. Mr. Clarence Byron's lying in his bunk, sir. He says he can't come here. He's got a heart attack. A heart attack? That's rather convenient, eh, Holmes? Yes, Watson. And it's also convenient that there's a doctor aboard. Let's go and see him, shall we? Any better, Mr. Byron? Yes. Yes, I do, Doctor. That injection you gave me helped. Did you tell us, I suppose? No, it wasn't. Holmes' his heart perfectly sound. He was simulating an attack. So I gathered, since an injection of plain water apparently gave him immediate relief. Plain water? Yes, your heartbeat was full and regular, and your color normal. So I decided to try an experiment. And a very successful one. Why did you pretend to have a heart attack, Mr. Byron? I, I wasn't pretending. I do have a bad heart. That I don't doubt. Only a bad heart could prompt you to swindle your brother and then murder him. I didn't murder him. Though, uh, I can tell you who did. Oh? You are very eager to shift suspicion, Mr. Byron. Who, in your opinion, murdered your brother? That deckhand, Arthur Coggins. Only a few days ago he threatened my brother's life. You heard him make the threat? Yes, I did. It was his second day aboard. It was early in the morning, and I was strolling on deck when I came on this man, Coggins, who was standing by the mainmast, practicing throwing a knife. You're pretty handy with a knife, Coggins. What's that? I said you're pretty handy with a knife. Yes, I know how to use a knife. Do you uh, think you're going to like being on this ship? No. Not if I don't get treated like a human being. Just yesterday, the owner yells out to me, Yeah, you, whatever your name is, treating me like dirt. Whatever your name is. Can't he find out my name? I'm as good as he is. One of these dark nights, he'll get what's coming to him. That's what he said, Mr. Holmes. And he looked as if he meant business. He's an expert with a knife, you say. Holmes, do you think it's possible that Coggins threw the knife through a porthole into the dead man's cabin? Yes, Watson, it's possible. Your story was interesting, Mr. Byron, though, of course, entirely uncorroborated. I think we'll go and talk to the captain and see if he can supplement your information. Well, Mr. 
Holmes, I, I can't answer for the passengers. That's no business of mine. I appreciate that, Captain Small. But you'll answer for your crew, no doubt. That I will, sir. And this man Coggins is a no good if ever I saw one. Insubordinate, surly, always talking about how he's as good and better than those who employ him. Then why did you engage him, Captain? I didn't, sir. That was arranged by my employer, Mr. George Barron. If I had my way, Coggins would have gone back ashore the first day he stepped aboard. Where are his... Great Scott, is that a revolver shot? It sounded like it, and it came from the forecastle. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! This way, Sergeant. Good heavens! Why, it's Coggins! With a smoking revolver in his right hand. He's committed suicide. Yes. Very convincing, isn't it? His head is sprawled on a piece of fool's cap. A confession note, no doubt. Yes, it is. Look at this. I killed him, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, so I took the quick way out. Case is solved, Holmes. On the contrary, Watson, it's becoming more involved. If you look closely, you will realize that we now have two murders to solve instead of one. And somewhere on this boat, a murderer is still at large, and may strike a third time. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll find out if the murderer does strike a third time. But first, men, if you're bald, you might as well grin and bear it because science tells us it's impossible to grow hair where the hair roots are dead. But you certainly can make the most of the hair you've got. And men, you can't beat Kreml hair tonic. To help you, Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps hair neatly in place longer and without that offensive, greasy look. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Let me repeat, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation right in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp feels so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff and has a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. And for hair that's so dry that it cracks and falls, remember Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. Men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. It's such a nice, clean product, you can use it every day so that your hair always looks its best. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. So, Dr. Watson, the apparent suicide turned out to be another of the murderer's victims. Yes, Mr. Bell. Holmes at once sent Sergeant Dobson to check the passengers while the three of us stood in that tiny cabin, an oil lamp swinging above us and shedding a strange glow on the macabre scene. I asked him why he was so positive that it wasn't suicide. You will notice, Watson, that the revolver is in Coggins' right hand. Yes, Holmes, I don't see what... Then ignore the right hand and observe the left. A deck hand is accustomed to hard manual labor. Notice the calluses on his left hand and the freedom from them on the right. By Jove, he was left-handed. Yes, he was, Mr. Holmes. I, I, I've noticed him at work. Again, you'll observe the shot entered his head from behind the right ear. A remarkable feat of dexterity for a left-handed man. And the murderer had the note ready, shot Coggins from behind, but made the mistake of placing the revolver in the wrong hand. Precisely. But this note, obviously in disguised writing, poses another problem. What does the phrase, and with my record, I knew you'd catch me, mean? He must have had a police record. But why volunteer the information? I wonder if the murderer had a reason. Captain, you said that Cockins was engaged by Mr. George Byron. Well, sir, he told me about the new man, but I don't know that he interviewed him personally. Where was he engaged? At the Siemens Hostel uh, here in the village. Well, what are you getting at home? Surely it's obvious, Watson. If this man Coggins had a police record, his murderer might have deliberately placed him on this boat knowing he would be suspected. Yes, yes, it's possible. But the question is, who engaged him? Well, Sergeant? All three of them in their cabins, Mr. Holmes, and swore they hadn't left them. And yet we know that one of them must have slipped down here and shot Coggins? Lock them in their cabin, Sergeant. Keep good watch on them. Dr. Watson and I are going ashore. Ashore? Why, Holmes, when the murderer's here on this boat? Because I'm convinced that the clue to his identity lies waiting for us at the Seaman's Hostel. Where is the place, Sergeant? And who runs it? Old Ma Jenkins. It's the house just next to the Red Lion on the quayside. Splendid. Watson, we're taking this note and rowing ashore. Another trip in that filthy rowing boat? Must we, Holmes? (laughs) 
It's a fine time of night to rootle a respectable woman out of a warm bed, I must say, and no mistake. But, Mrs. Jenkins... Call you... me Ma. Everyone calls me Ma. Very well. We've come to you because you're the one person who can help solve two murders that took place on the Sally Martin tonight. Murder? Come into me parlor. I'll light the lamp. There. Now, what's this you say happened aboard the Sally Martin? The owner, Mr. Barron, was stabbed to death about ten o'clock tonight. Later on, a seaman by the name of Arthur Coggins was killed, too. Arthur was killed. You knew this man, Arthur Coggins? Of course I did. Over a year he's been staying with me. He couldn't get a ship because of his record. What record was that? He brought his ship's papers to me. They all do when they're out of a berth. The last ship he was on two years ago, it was. He got mixed up in a knife fight. Oh, did he? Alaska was killed and Arthur arrested. They couldn't prove he was guilty, but he hasn't had a birth since because it was written in his papers. Well, that fits in with your theory, Holmes. The murderer engaged him deliberately, knowing his record. Exactly. Mrs. Uh, Ma. That's me. Do you recall the name of the man who interviewed Coggins? No. The man who engaged him for the Sally Martin? Uh-uh. No. But, but it's here in my book. It's the last entry I made. Uh, here it is. Clarence Byron. The brother. There's our man, Holmes. Could you describe the appearance of Mr. Byron, Ma'am? No, I, I can't say I remember much about it. He was all muffled up. He was a nice-spoken gentleman, though. You can recall no clue to his identity? It's uh, worth a sovereign to you, if you can. A sovereign? Well, let me think out. Y yes, there's one thing I do remember. He had a gold signet ring on his right hand. Splendid, Ma. Watson, the case is solved. Of course it is. Clarence is the man. May I congratulate you on your powers of observation, Watson? Ma, here are two sovereigns for you. Two? But you The said... extra one is for the privilege uh, of borrowing this uh, registry book of yours for a few uh, hours. No. I'm taking it back to the Sally Martin with us so that we may compare the handwriting in it with that of a murderer. <laughs> This is ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. Why should you ask Clarence to sign his name? Bear with me a few moments longer, Mrs. Byron, and you'll see why. I'm blessed if I know what you're up to, Mr. Holmes. I'm a little patient, Sergeant, and you'll see, too. Have you any objection to signing your name, Mr. Byron? I uh, suppose not, though I'm just as confused as the rest of them. There. Thank you. And now, Mr. Hodgson, I wonder if you'd mind helping us. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. What can I do? You saw the forged check. I wonder if you'd try and imitate the signature that Mr. Clarence Byron has just written. Mr. Byron's signature? Yes, his writing is extremely individual, but I think you could help prove that under certain circumstances it can be elastic. See how nearly you can imitate it. I think it'll help us to prove that he murdered his brother. Clarence, you did murder George. I knew it. Mabel, you're out of your mind. Will you copy his signature, Mr. Hodgson? Of course, if you think it'll help you. Holmes, Holmes, look, Shh, Hodgson. Sign, please, Mr. Hodgson. Clarence Byron. There. Thank you. That's a remarkably fine gold signet ring you're wearing, Mr. Hodgson. Thank you. Watson, give me Mar Jenkins' register book. There you are, Holmes. Sergeant, I want you to compare the signature in this book with that which Mr. Hodgson has just given us. I think you'll agree that they're both written by the same man. They are. Well, blow me down. So he forged Clarence's signature. Exactly. He is quite a specialist in handwriting. Albert, you didn't kill him. You couldn't have done it. It's no good, Mabel, and you know it as well as I do. You knew what I was up to. You helped me. <gasps> you suggested that I use Clarence's name. That's a lie. It's a not lie or not, Sergeant, I suggest you take out your notebook. They're talking in front of witnesses, so make the most of the fact. <laughs> The sun's coming up, Watson. Oh, yes, and the, the sea's calmer, Hingham. A very satisfactory start to a new day. The confessed murderer and his accomplice, both of them safely in the care of the police. Yes, I was convinced, until we found him murdered, that Coggins, the, the deckhand, was the guilty body. Exactly what you were meant to think. I thought that, uh, as he was an expert knife thrower, he could have thrown one through a porthole into the dead man's cabin. No, Watson. Both portholes were at the head of the bunk. But the knife wound was from the underside of the heart and upwards. 
It would have been impossible to have thrown the knife through a porthole at such an yes, angle. Yes, I can see it all now. Young Hodgson, coveting his employer's wife, planned a knife murder and then engaged Coggins, knowing that with his record, he'd be the logical suspect. Yes, but like so many murderers, he tried to be too clever. He left enough clues to hang himself half a dozen but times why over. Why did Clarence pretend to have that heart attack? The nervousness of a person who knows himself to be under suspicion. A futile attempt to escape interrogation. Well, I'm glad it's all over. I'm exhausted and I'm frozen. And I'm delighted to think that this is my last trip in this horrible rowing boat. Whereas I'm feeling very stimulated. And in a distinctly altruistic mood. Altruistic? What do you mean, Holmes? If you'll observe the flurry of excitement at the quayside, the figures in blue surge that are at this moment embarking in boats, you'll realize that the police from Canterbury have just arrived. Well, I still don't see how altruism comes into the picture. I intend to claim no credit in the solution of this crime. And in consequence, I see little reason why our old friend Sergeant Dobson should not very soon be known as Inspector Dobson. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us something about next week's story. But first, girls, if you want to really make a hit with the boyfriend... Here's a beauty tip right out from here in Hollywood. And one which lovely Powers models were among the first to discover. Give your hair a ten-minute glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed so that it actually brings out all the brilliant, natural luster of each tiny strand of hair. Cremel Shampoo leaves the hair fairly teeming with highlights. And don't forget, Cremel Shampoo is wonderful for the entire family. Yes, even in the hardest water, it whips up gobs of rich, luxurious foam, which penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy the large family size of Cremel Shampoo. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel Shampoo, the largest selling shampoo with an oil base. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week... Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes solved a murder with only one clue. The depth to which the parsley had sunk in the butter on a hot summer's day. I call this bizarre adventure the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Rygate Puzzle. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. Well, I have to say, I was suspicious of the wife during her uh, interview um, when her tone uh, changed uh, so quickly uh, when they were wanting to begin the questioning. Overall, this is uh, just almost a typical Sherlock Holmes mystery. And once again, we end up with one of those incidental two episodes in a row Somewhat similar, as both involve Waters and our detectives on vacation and murder, murder following them wherever they happen to go. Anyway, here's the comment I was talking about uh, before the show. This comes from John. I've been listening to your show for a while and really enjoy it. I hope in the future you play Richard Diamond as he is one of my favorite old-time detectives. In this episode, you talked about different iterations of Sherlock Holmes. One that I haven't heard you mention is the movie The Young Sherlock Holmes by Spielberg. Both my wife and I enjoy the, that movie, having not read any Sherlock Holmes novels. I don't know how well it captures uh, the spirit of Holmes. I would be interested in your opinion. Well, thanks so much for the comment, John. As I mentioned, I hadn't uh, seen the film since I was 9 or 10. But having watched it afresh, um, I, I think that... More than anything else, the story is, it's very speculative. In fact, at the, both at the beginning and end of the movie, there are disclosures saying this basically was not 
based on an Arthur Conan Doyle story, and and acknowledging that Holmes and Watson didn't meet until they were adults, unlike in the movie where they met at this uh, academy. Overall, I found the movie to be mostly uh, plausible, as it looked at what Sherlock Holmes might have been like as a teenager, and what may have made him who he was. I think that that topic of what made Sherlock Holmes Sherlock Holmes will always spark a, a bit of imagination, because he continues to be this really uh, fascinating uh, character that people just can't seem to get enough of. So thanks for the question, John. We got a comment regarding Pat Novak. Very nice, detailed info on Jack Webb and Richard Breen. This is the first I've heard of Breen. He was the silent partner of Webb. The Jocko speeches were certainly written by a great wordsmith, and Tudor was the perfect actor to deliver them. Indeed, the Pat Novak series was wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Well, thank you. And I've often thought that you could put the Jocko Madigan speeches along with the best Pat Novak quips, and it would make a really fun book. Over on Facebook, Stephen Wakefield comments, I love your show, thanks. Well, thank you, Stephen, for your nice comment. And thanks to everybody who's contacted the show. We'll be back tomorrow with yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Before we get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, I do want to remind you, when you're making your travel plans... Remember the name johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is through uh, is through Priceline, which means you can either name your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, or more, or you can choose from published fares. It's important to get the best deal you can on travel in this uh, tight economy. Plus, uh, your purchases help support the great detectives of old time radio. Well, let's get into today's episode: the Leland Blackburn matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, Bob Hall at Plymouth. We've got a bad thing down here. Oh, what's that? One of our company investigators has been killed. I think you knew him, Gene Reimer. Gene Reimer is dead. Yeah, shot to death. We learned of it this morning. Sent him down to Charleston to look into a murder. Does his wife know yet? She was with him. I mean, she went to Charleston with him. We want to put somebody right on it, Johnny. That's why I called. Uh, oh, sure, Bob. I'll... I'll come right over and get the rest of the story from you. Edmund O'Brien and another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Plymouth Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Leland Blackburn matter. <laughs> Expense account item 1250, cab fare from my apartment to the Plymouth building. Hey, Johnny. Yeah? Oh, hi, Merle. What are you doing down here? Well, the Gene Reimer shooting. I wondered if it heard. We talked a lot about you. You were good friends. We learned the business together in the Pinkerton Agency. Almost opened our own office. It didn't pan out. I wish it had. We're going to miss him around here. He was a great guy. Yeah. Well, Bob Hall's waiting for me, Merle. I'd better get in there. Sure. Good luck, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Dollar. He's waiting for you. You can go right in. Thanks. How are you, Bob? Thanks for coming right over, Johnny. Wouldn't have blamed you if you turned it down. Forget it. I feel pretty awful about it. I gave the case to Gene myself. He wasn't up for one, but there would have been some extra money for him. I knew he needed it. He didn't have to take the case. He didn't have to earn a living this way. It's a funny thing for you to say. Well, there's no other way to look at it. You can't hunt trouble forever without finally running into some. I got the idea that you were his friend. I was. But you aren't hiring a friend, Bob. You're hiring an investigator. If you want me to go to work on this, I'd better get some facts. I don't understand you. What about the case he was on? You said it was murder? A policyholder named Leland Blackburn was bludgeoned to death in his home. How long had Gene been on it? Less than a week, five days. Had he sent in any report on what he'd learned? No, he hadn't. Is that all? That's all I know. He was staying at the Hotel Lee. His wife is still there. As I said, she'd been with him. I suggest you talk to her first. I will. I'll leave as soon as I can get plane space. All right, guys. Good luck.
Expense account item two, eighty-five dollars transportation between Hartford and the Hotel Lee in Charleston. It was eight thirty p.m. by the time I checked in, and my first move was to the phone. Yes. It was Johnny, Barbara. Johnny, where are you? The floor above you. The Plymouth Company sent me down to look into Jean's death. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Johnny. When will I see you? As soon as possible. Oh. Give me just 15 minutes to put a face on it. Come on down. Hello. Hello. It's been a long time. I, I can't tell you what a shock it was to hear your voice on the phone. I, I've been thinking about you. Oh? It's, it's natural to... You've been the only one I've turned to when it was trouble. How did the company happen to send you? Because I knew Jean, I guess. Was anything said about us? There was no reason for that. Everything between you and me stopped when you got married. We'd better keep it that way now. Sure. It was a beautiful marriage all the way around. I told you it would be. You remember that? Yes. But there was a side of Jean Reimer that hardly anybody knew. You didn't believe me. I learned to. And you made some pretty serious statements to me after you did. I want to get that off my chest before we go any farther. I don't know how many times you told me that you were afraid you were going to kill him for what he'd done to you. And you meant it, didn't you? Johnny. The last time was less than a month ago. You don't think I killed him? I remember what you said. Johnny, don't. Why did you come to Charleston with him? Because he made me come. Why? Because he... I don't want to tell you. Why not? It doesn't have anything to do with what happened. Then you shouldn't mind telling me. He found out about somebody I'd been seeing in Hartford. I know it sounds cheap, but you must realize... Never mind that. Dean brought you down here to keep you away from this guy. Yes. Johnny, you can't think I killed him. I hope you didn't. For old times' sake, I'd hate to learn that you did. They were good times, Johnny. What do you know about the case Gene was working on? Nothing. He never talked about any of them. Well, I'll start on it tomorrow. Good night, Barbara. Expense count item three, two dollars, cab fare. The next morning, the police headquarters, where I met Lieutenant Sims, the officer in charge of both killings. Well, looks to me like they piled a load of work on your shoulders, Dollar. You signed to both murders? Chances are that they go together, don't you think? Hard to figure that far yet. Well, what have you got on this Leland Blackburn? The file isn't complete on him. The widow and son refused to authorize an autopsy. Took a few days to force it through, so we got no report. Who was he? An old codger, a pillar of the old South, so to speak. He was a broker, him and his son Rollin, pretty wealthy folks. What do you think was the motive? Well, we're thinking it was robbery. Nobody knows how much, but old Leland's wallet was empty when they found it. He just told the phone operator he wanted the police when he was hit. The phone was still in his hand. Well, I'll have to go and talk to the family. Help yourself. Now, this other Hartford man, a likable kind of fellow, you know him? Yeah, I, I know Gene for quite a few years. Makes it bad when it's a friend, don't it? Well, it doesn't help. Do you have anything on his death? No, absolutely nothing. He was shot three times at close range with a thirty-two caliber gun. All three slugs went through him and smashed up on a brick wall behind him. Spoiled him for ballistics. Why did it happen? In an alley off Magazine Street. And that's why we can't figure any connection between that shooting and the Blackburn killing. You know this town? No. Why, no Blackburn had set foot in that Magazine Street section. They'd live at the other end of the town, south of Broad Street. That's a whole lot closer to heaven, I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Lieutenant. Looks like I've got a lot of cold trail to follow, so I'd better get moving. Later that day, after checking by phone to learn when the son would be home, I went to the Blackburn residence. It was a warm, friendly estate glowing with southern tradition. The same thing could have been said about the widow, Mrs. Blackburn. But son Rollin must have taken after his father. What I resent most of all is that you are here simply because you suspect either Mother and me or both of us of nefarious plot. Now, Rollins. Isn't that right? Murder is a hard thing to ignore, Mr. Blackburn. I am not ignoring it, but I believe our local police are quite able to do what must be done. 
I just think you'd be interested in having as many people as possible working to clear it up. Naturally, I want to see my father's killers brought to justice. But I don't think father would appreciate the importation of investigators from Hartford. Rollin, please. I came here primarily to investigate the death of the first Hartford man. I'm afraid you'll have to put up with me until I satisfy myself that there's no connection between your father and that. What possible connection could there be? I don't know. There isn't any. And if I hear of you dragging the Blackburn name into a sordid murder in that part of town, I will personally thrash you to within an inch of your life. Rollins, I must insist. I think perhaps that if you left, Mr. Dollar and I could conclude this meeting much more rapidly. Don't you have an appointment someplace? Don't you forget what I said, Dollar. I won't. Oh, I must apologize, Mr. Dollar. You don't have to. The loss of his father has been a great shock to him. And I must say that other young man who was here as pleasant as he tried to be did leave us with the impression that he suspected us. One doesn't say things like that about the Blackburns. It is an extremely proud and moral family. I understand, I don't want you to think that I... Now, Mr. Dollar, what do you want me to do? Well, I think you've probably been asked these questions by Mr. Reimer, but if you'll bear with me... Of course. Ah. Were you here the night your husband died? Yes. I was in the other wing where our bedrooms are. Roland was there, too. But he came down to the kitchen. That's through there. And found poor Leland. Neither of you heard anything? No. I had my radio on, I remember. But even so, it is quite a big house. It's a beautiful house. Mrs. Blackburn, do you have any idea who could have done this thing? Any enemies of your husband's? I knew of nobody who disliked Leland. He was a charitable, honest man. And a pious one. I'm sorry, Mrs. Blackburn. I won't bother you any longer. My only hope is that I may join him soon. Lieutenant Sim. This is Dollar, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah. What have you been up to? I've been out to see the Blackburns. How did you reconstruct the killing out there? Well, like I said, he still had the phone in his hand. He'd been hit a number of times with some blunt instrument. Anything to make you think there was more than one killer? No. The wounds were all on the right side of the head. Struck from behind by a right-handed man. Why? The son. He was a little agitated at my being there. He said killers. What's that? He said he wanted to see his father's killers brought to justice. Plural. What would make him say a thing like that? I don't know. Well, as it stands, it's not worth anything as evidence, but I thought I'd tell you. To me, at that moment, it meant there was a possibility that Roland Blackburn knew more than he was saying. I spent another two hours trying to find something to strengthen that possibility, the financial condition of both the family and their brokerage firm. I got no place with it, but I returned to my hotel with the feeling that that one slip was going to develop into the link to connect Gene's death with the Blackburn investigation. The feeling lasted only a few seconds after I met the man who was waiting for me outside my room. Mr. Dollar, I'm Hal Brand. Oh, yeah? I'm the hotel detective here. Oh. I think I'd better talk to you. What about? The woman down on 413, Mrs. Reimer. How'd you find out about me? I've been keeping my eye on her. I saw you go to see her and checked on you. I had an idea that insurance company would send somebody else. Why have you been watching her? Her husband paid me to. I guess there was something wrong between them. Yeah. A man showed up to see her the day the husband was killed. I didn't get a chance to tell him, but I thought I ought to tell you. Who is he? Richard is his name. George. He's in the Clemens Hotel up the street. He checked in from Hartford, too. Come on the room, Brian. I want to hear the rest of it. Sure. There isn't much more. This Richard showed up at the Rhymer room about one in the afternoon. Rhymer was out, so I didn't get to him. And then he was shot that night about ten. Maybe it don't mean anything. You know where Richards is now? He checked out this afternoon, took the 540 plane in New York. Let me pour you a drink, Brian? Sure. You know a man's a fool to marry a woman as beautiful as that. 
You always need trouble. That's my personal opinion anyway. My wife's as ugly as sin. That's as far as it goes. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks. Have you told this to the police, Brian? Not yet. Why not? Oh, I figure a couple of days won't make any difference. If the police don't come up with something else, but then I'll tell them. You talk to her. What do you think? I don't know, but I'm going down to see her. Wouldn't be very smart, would it? Maybe not. That's the way I have to play it. Help yourself to another drink, Brian, and... And thanks. I've got to see you. Sure, Johnny. Come in. What's the matter? Why'd you lie to me last night? I, I didn't. I, I don't understand. George Richards. Why didn't you tell me he was here? How did you find out? He was seen coming to this room. Why didn't you tell me? I was afraid to. Yeah, that I believe. I put myself out on a limb for you today because I thought there was a chance you wouldn't lie to me. I withheld information. They want a motive for Gene's murder, and I didn't mention you. I didn't kill him. That doesn't mean anything now that there's Richards. I didn't know he was here until I opened that door. He stayed here ten minutes, and I made him leave. I told him to go back home or there'd be real trouble. He didn't leave until this afternoon. I didn't know that. Johnny, I, I know I should have told you last night. I've always trusted you, but I knew how bad the situation would look, and I I just prayed that nobody would know George was here. You weren't covering up for him? No. I didn't know, Johnny. I I didn't know he was still here. Quit it. Quit it, will you? Come on, sit down. Get a hold of yourself. Look, I want to believe you, Barbara. You know that. But it doesn't make any difference now whether I do or not. The police are going to learn about Richards. Are you going to tell them? I imagine they'll tell me. But I can't hold back anymore. And with the answers I'll have to give them, they can probably indict you for murder, or at least accessory with Richard. I didn't kill him. I, I don't know anything about stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I don't need hysterics. I need proof. How can you prove to me that you knew nothing about it? I don't know. Would Richards have done it alone? No. How can you prove that? It's a thing I know. I can't use things you know. I need people and statements. People who will swear that they saw you at the time Gene Reimer was killed. People who will swear they saw Richard. It was nine o'clock. I was here. I can check that. That's all I know. Johnny, stop. Please stop. I can't stand anymore. Uh, all right, Angel. I tried to find an alibi for George Richards that night, but a stranger in a city the size of Charleston is hard to nail down. I went to the Clemens Hotel and questioned bellboys, clerks, maids, and bartenders, but those who remembered him hadn't seen him during the evening in question, and I tried cab drivers with no better success. It was after midnight when I went to bed and nine the next morning when I was awakened by a summons from the police accompanied by official transportation. Here he is, Lieutenant. Hey, Sergeant. You can wait outside. Yes. Sit down, Dollar. Thanks. I had an interesting chat with the hotel detective where you're stopping. Oh, I'm not surprised, Lieutenant. What's the matter with you, son? You put yourself in a pretty darn serious position by holding back information from me. Why'd you do it? I'm not sure. You admitted knowing that Gene Reimer. Why didn't you tell me then that you, you knew about trouble between him and his wife? Well, I wanted to check the other angles first, the Blackburn investigation. How bad was this trouble? Pretty bad. Reimer had a mean streak that didn't show, except to his closest friends and intimates. You'd say uh, he did her bodily harm? Yep, lots of it. How'd you find out? From her. How well did you know her? I knew her before they were married. In love with her by any chance? If I had been, I would have married her. I know what you're driving at, Lieutenant. The possibility is that, that I came down here to protect her from a murder charge. Well, that's half true. What's that? She's been my friend. I didn't want to see her pulled in if she wasn't mixed up in it. You don't think she was? I'll have to leave that for you. I know she had a motive, and to make it better, a possible accomplice turns up. But so far, it's all circumstantial. And we put a searcher out on this man, Richards. That's how good them circumstances look to us. Sure. And I'll bet I can reconstruct your reconstruction. A phony tip to rhyme on how to crack the Blackburn thing, an appointment on Magazine Street, and the payoff. Huh? You break that down? No, I tried. Barbara has an alibi, but Richards hasn't. 
Well, I've got to have somebody for that killing, Dollar. I'm going to bring her in. I'm surprised you haven't already. I want to talk to you first. I want you to stay here while I talk to her. Why? Why, you think she'll break down because of me? What's the matter with that board? I'll be right back. I've got to go get a man to pick her up. Contemplating suicide. Where's Lieutenant Sims? Just went out the other door. Be right back. Hey, you finally got the autopsy report on old man Blackburn. You sound as if you really didn't believe he was dead. Oh, no, he's dead all right. What is it, Sergeant? The Blackburn autopsy report. Yeah, look here. Hmm? Well, I'll be... Narcotics, you sir. The press has been waiting for this, Lieutenant. And they've got a right to it. No, wait. Uh, don't give it to him yet. This has been pretty hard on that family. Hold on to it. No use dragging them through any more mud. At least till the federal men go to work on it. All right, sir. You'll be here in a few minutes, Dollar. So relax. i got to run through a few reports while we wait. It was hardly the time for relaxation, but I tried. We sat through an hour of questions to which there was no provable answers. And at the end of it, Barbara Reimer was booked on suspicion of murder and I was released on bail, charged with suspicion of being accessory after the fact. I had only one place to go. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blackburn. Good afternoon. I'm Mr. Dollar. You remember me? Of course I do. I wasn't expecting you. I'm sorry I didn't have time to phone. May I come in? Yes. Your son at home? No, he's at the office. What is it, Mr. Dollar? A girl has been arrested because the police think she killed Mr. Reimer, the other man from Hartford. Oh, I didn't know. I don't think she did it. I don't think I understand, Mr. Dollar. Why have you come here? Because I think you know she didn't do it, Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Dollar. Could we sit down someplace? Yes. In the drawing room. Now... If you please, sir, what is the meaning of it? Why did you refuse to allow an autopsy to be performed on your husband? Because I believe it to be a revolting and savage practice. A mental torture that no one has the right to ask the survivors to experience. I will not condone it. Usually laws are stronger than human feelings. You know that one had been performed? I refused. Oh, Roland told me there was nothing to fear. He was wrong. I will not condone it. It's a matter of official record now, Mrs. Blackburn. The report says your husband was a narcotics user. He was not. He was. Your son knew it, and I think you did. I shall have to ask you to leave, Mr. Dollar. Please, Mrs. Blackburn, that wouldn't do any good. When I was here before, maybe you remember, your son said something he didn't intend to say. He told me that more than one man killed your husband. He said killers. He was upset. Both murders had something to do with the narcotics your husband used, didn't they? No. The police haven't been able to find a link between the Blackburn name and the magazine street section. The narcotics made that link, isn't that right? No. Gene Reimer must have found out. He was killed. Now a woman is charged with a murder she had nothing to do with. What else do you want? Oh. We thought we were doing the right thing. Why did you think that? We hope to save Leland, that shame. And Roland, his son, and his widow. Jean Rhyme, I must have learned from you. No. No one was to be told. Mr. Rhyme discovered it himself. When he faced us, we begged him to say nothing. But when he threatened us, we told him their names. The names of the people who supplied your husband? Yes. And made a hell of our lives. They've extorted money from us for almost ten years. We, of the inviolate family. They killed your husband. They came that night to force him to buy more. And when he refused and tried to telephone the police, they killed him. I want you to tell me who these people are. We told Mr. Rama. And, and he... I won't go alone. It will be finished then. This farce we live. It would be finished anyway. Yes. To go no further. There are two. 
One is named Miller. The other, Stone. Where do I find him? You won't go alone. We've caused one death. I'll be all right. I'll tell you where to find them. I hadn't planned to go alone, but on the way, I began to wonder if the time I spent interesting the police wouldn't be used by Mrs. Blackburn to warn the two men whose capture would put the finish to the family reputation. So I didn't contact Lieutenant Sims. Instead, I stopped by my hotel to pick up an automatic and cab to the Magazine Street address by myself. Take it easy up there if I was you. Thanks, I will. Here you are. Thanks, sir. Who are you? Miller. What's the idea of pushing in? I just came from the Blackburn place. Where? The old lady is tired of trying to save the family pride. She talked again. What? What other reason would I have for being here? She's ready to talk to the police about her husband. I'm ready to talk to you about Gene Reimer. I don't get it. You'd better start. Come on. Where? Out the door. We'll find our way. Now, listen to me. You can't pull a man around like this without saying why I haven't done nothing. Then why argue? All right, I'll go. Miller! Miller! Miller? Get away from me. Find Stone, I... I gotta talk to Stone. He did get a chance to talk to Stone, but not before Lieutenant Sims heard him out and added his statement to that of the surviving Blackburns, which cleared Barbara Reimer and yours truly. Expense account item three, $110, miscellaneous expenses in Charleston. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total. Oh, excuse me. Yep. Hello, Johnny. Oh. Hi, Barbara. I thought you were coming over. It's after four. Uh, well, as a, as a matter of fact, I was just going to phone. I, I can't make it. What's the matter, Johnny? I've got another case. What's the matter, Johnny? I, I have to earn a living. All right. You know where to find me if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try to call you when I get back to town, okay? Goodbye. Uh, expense count total, $345.75. Remarks? This was a fairly personal assignment, and it brings to mind a fairly personal observation. Cops, private or otherwise, should never marry. They're lousy husbands because they're away from home so much. But more important, they leave too many widows. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were John Daner, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Georgia Ellis, John McIntyre, and Larry Dobkin. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. You can sing it again on CBS tonight for a whole hour of fun-packed, music-packed entertainment. And maybe Dan Seymour will be calling you to solve one of the tuneful little riddle songs that lead to a chance at radio's largest cash jackpot, $5,000, plus $10,000 more in wonderful prizes. Alan Dale, Judy Lynn, Bob Howard, the Riddlers, and Ray Block Orchestra are on hand to sing and play the riddle tunes leading up to Dan Seymour's Coast to Coast Call. Be listening again later tonight when Sing It Again comes along on most of these same CBS stations. Now stay tuned for Von Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations.
This is CBS, where you laugh with Lucille Ball and my favorite husband on Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, this was a very solid episode with a great mystery and I, th- I thought a very good uh, outcome. Definitely just a classic hard-boiled uh, story. Also, the music in this uh, episode was different and uh, reminiscent of some notes that I heard in the uh, Bob Bailey Johnny Dollars uh, that I haven't heard uh, heretofore. Um, I would actually almost be willing to bet money that this particular episode was adapted from a Sam Spade script. It's got kind of that feel. Plus, to me, the key clue in this is Edmund O'Brien stating he was a Pinkerton operative. Given that uh, general impression of Johnny Dollar's age doesn't quite seem to fit. While the Pinkerton agency was certainly around, the height of the Pinkerton man really kind of came into an end in the 20s and 30s. I've yet to run into that uh, particular episode of Sam Spade, so it may be among the existing recordings. Even if it's not, there's far more episodes of Sam Spade that are missing than are in actual existence. So this could be based on a lost episode. Again, total speculation, but that Pinkerton thing uh, definitely gives me a hint that that might be the case. I should note that this is kind of the end of an era of having every week's Johnny Dollar episode right at your fingertips. Of the first 42 Edmund O'Brien, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar episodes, we're very fortunate to have 41 However, this episode aired December 16, 1950, and the last two episodes of 1950 and the first episode of 1951 are missing. And we only have 34 of the 48 episodes that uh, were aired in 1951. Speaking of episode availability, I got a nice uh, email this past week from Jeremy, who offered to share episodes from his uh, Johnny Dollar uh, collection that were with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Armed Forces Radio and Television Service uh, by that time. I compared a list and uh, pretty much had everything that uh, that was on his list, uh, but appreciated the offer. Uh, And of course, it, it brings up a good opportunity to talk about the Armed Forces Radio Service. When we get into particularly the later Johnny Dollar episodes, there are dozens upon dozens where the only version we have or the, is the one that was uh, transcribed for the Armed Forces Radio Service. And that may be one of the big keys to uh, the series' uh, survival. And why it made sense. Uh, in the 1950s, television was really new in America, but it was even newer around the world where American forces would uh, be stationed. So the demand for radio programs... Uh, overseas uh, continued long after they'd ceased at home. So that's why you actually had a uh, limited run uh, radio series called Matthew Slade that was made in the U.S. uh, in 1964, two years after Johnny Dollar ended uh, its run, being aired uh, by the Armed Forces Radio Service. In fact, when radio shows from the U.S. became scarce, uh, they actually began to um, rebroadcast episodes of foreign shows. Uh, Walk Softly Peter Troy from South Africa was one of the most noted of them. So it's a fascinating history and a great reason why we have so much uh, radio to enjoy today. Well, uh, he actually went ahead and commented and said, I've listened to Nero and Holmes a lot, but had not heard the Abbots or let George do it, both of which I like. I'm glad I got the big old school iPod that can hold a lot. My territory uh, from service work is from LaGrande to Burley, so I listen to a lot of stuff. I followed your link to Audible and signed up. I've been thinking about it and figured you might as well get the credit. Um, if you need any help with anything, let me know. Well, thanks so much for the email, Jeremy, and for the kind offer. It's much appreciated. 
Then we have this comment from Joel said, uh, you mentioned the portrayal of unhelpful police on, uh, this was regarding the Woodward Manila matter. I felt the writers were playing out a manana stereotype with the Filipinos. The captain kept saying tomorrow, so perhaps this was a bit of racial stereotyping. Funny thing was that the police did come to the aid at the end in stopping the boat and killing the captain, also revealing the cause of death as strangulations. I guess in the 1940s it was okay to make these kind of stereotypes. Thanks again for the great podcast. Uh, well, thanks, Joel. This one uh, was, of course, a, a 1950 episode, but I think the point remains the same. Perhaps... Um, a little more used to the uh, Bob Bailey, uh, Johnny Dollar, when it comes to dealing with uh, international uh, police. Usually, there's a, a um, on the Bob Bailey uh, episodes, there's a police officer every week. They've got their own little quirks, but unless they are crooked, which I think was only the case in one or two episodes, uh, they are extremely reliable and dependable, regardless of nationality or where they happen to be. But perhaps a different uh, production. You may you may be correct, though, Joel. Well, that'll do it for now. We'll be back uh, next week with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, on Friday and on Monday with the Abbots. And be sure to watch this week. We're going to lay down the law, Burke's Law. Uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, reminding you, uh, email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And remember, uh, Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Uh, but from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.